If you start poking around at where the data from some of the most popular maps online comes from, one name keeps coming up a lot. OpenStreetMap is many things, but it's usually referred to as the Wikipedia of maps. OpenStreetMap isn't owned or operated by any single person. If you go to the website, not only is there a search button, there's also an edit button. Just like Wikipedia, anybody can read, but also edit the data. And a lot of people have been taking part over the years. As of September 2022, OpenStreetMap has over 9 million registered users. But what's the use of an open data map? Well, a lot of companies seem to find it incredibly valuable. Lyft uses this to map their driver and riders. Facebook uses it as the source of their base map. And so does Mapbox, whose maps are used by Strava, The Lonely Planet, and The New York Times, to name a few. Even Pokemon Go started using OpenStreetMap recently. The story of OpenStreetMap, or OSM for short, starts all the way back in 2004 with its founder, Steve Coast. It's now been 18 years since the beginning of OpenStreetMap, and it's fair to say it has opened up countless use cases that just weren't financially viable before and completely changed the mapping landscape. So I wanted to sit down with Steve and ask him about how it started. A sort of surprise that you couldn't get access to map data. As an academic institution, it was very difficult to get access to map data. But also about his thoughts on the future of maps and tech in general, because he has some quite radical ideas. I think maps are going to disappear, that's my basic bad. This turned out into a conversation about the ever-accelerating rate of technology, how people are at the forefront and in the middle of it, and what the man behind one of the most successful open source projects thinks about all of it. Before we get started with the interview, I want to thank today's sponsor, which is OpenCage. I'm getting more and more ambitious with how I produce and create these episodes, so I'm very thankful for the support of the sponsors, which helped me finance some of that. If you work with addresses and location data, chances are you're going to need a geocoder. Geocoding is the act of translating coordinates, so think latitude and longitude, that are created by smartphones and tracking devices into human understandable places, like street names and place names, or the other way around. So OpenCage provides a geocoding API, which is built on top of open data sources, one of them being OpenStreetMap, very on topic. This allows them to provide their geocoding API at a pretty low cost, as well as having pretty loose licensing terms compared to proprietary platforms. So you can do things like store the data as long as you want, display it on any map, and use it publicly or behind a firewall. So if it's built on top of open data sources, you may be wondering, like, why wouldn't you be able to do it yourself? Well, you can totally make your own geocoder, but what OpenCage provides is just a simple API that works that is reliable, basically they take care of all the maintenance. For example, OpenStreetMap alone gets edited four to five million times a day. On top of that, OpenCage provides information like local time zones, what currency people use, and which phone code is used. Because OpenCage is based around open data, that means their pricing is also pretty affordable. And they have a pretty generous free trial that I encourage you to go take a look, especially if you're just playing around or are doing a personal project. Finally, which is pretty close to my heart and very on topic for this interview, they've been long supporters of the open source community and just geospatial community as a whole. So if this sounds interesting, you can go to the link in the description to see more about them. With all of that said, here's my conversation with Steve Coast. I've, I've started all these conversations the same way every time. I don't know if you know about this, but I like asking people how they would describe themselves. I'm curious, how would you describe yourself? Uh, <laughs> can we have an easier question, please? How's your Saturday? My Saturday, yeah, that's a much easier question. My Saturday is going well, thank you. <laughs> Great, thanks for coming, folks. <laughs> We're done. Um, how would I describe myself? I don't know, founder of OpenStreetMap, how about that? Yeah, that's just casual. What do you tell people, like, when you're, you know, people ask you, like, what do you do? Like, that's a pretty big thing, like founder of OpenStreetMap. Like we were talk talking about like diving earlier, stuff like that. Like let's get a little bit more into it. Like who is Steve Coast? Sure. I don't know. I think I like to see the obvious where people don't. Do you have examples of that? I think a big one is pretty simple. So we don't know what the future looks like, right? We don't really know, but most people think that they know what the future looks like because it's going to look like the past. And in some ways it will. 
right? But it's not going to look like the past. It's also going to be completely different. And we're continually surprised by things, right? And I think that's the kind of thing that I'm good at is remembering that we really have no idea what's going on, if that makes sense, and yeah. uh, that we can't predict what's going to happen. So like a nice example would be electric cars, right? That I would say that the public in general thinks electric cars are sort of like cars. But if you think about it, electric cars aren't like cars at all, right? They don't break down. There's no gas stations. They're going to be automated. You're not going to be facing forward, right? you'll be able to go to sleep and then wake up somewhere else, right? You can't go from the the horse and buggy to the horse's carriage and predict drive through McDonald's, right? And I think that electric cars are gonna do all kinds of wacky things, like they're gonna impact air travel. Because if I can go to sleep for eight hours in my car and wake up in a different city, that's gonna be way better than going through the airport system, right? There's going to be all these sort of strange fallouts. Mm. But if you just think, well, it's just a car, but it's quiet, or it's just a car, but it's, you know, faster, you're not going to get very far, right? But if you're able to put yourself, like, ask why a couple of times, or ask what then, what then, just a couple of times, you can get to some completely different outcomes. Why do you think you're good at that? I don't know. No idea. Do you have like examples of moments where you felt like you were like just to try to I want to understand that a little bit better because it feels like it's simple when you say it. It's just like asking why three times or five times, you know, the five whys. Yeah. Like what then? Is it just that or is there something else? Maybe it's practice. I don't know. It happens all the time. I remember I mean one thing that comes to mind is years ago I remember Putin saying that he was going to investigate Gazprom for tax evasion or something. And it was just obvious propaganda to make the stock fall. So I just put a bunch of money into Gazprom and then it like went back up a couple of weeks later or something like that. It's just, it's just seeing, looking past the obvious, right? Looking past what's in front of you. How do you get better at that? You said practice, like... I think practice, yeah. I think finance people tend to be very good at this because they it's sort of their job. Right. So some piece of news, they have to ask themselves, what is the implication for it for the market? Got it. Right. So like COVID happened. There's probably a lot of people sitting around thinking, hey, people are going to be sitting at home. So that means they're going to be spending more time on Zoom and Netflix. Right. Therefore, we should buy a bunch of Zoom and Netflix stocks. Right. A lot of things you can't really place a bet. Right. There's a lot of things I can't place a bet on. Like if I think that, uh, I don't know. Germany's not going to do well this winter or something. It's very difficult to place a bet where I'm going to see a return. Right. And you want to place a bet for sort of two reasons. One is sort of proof that you had, you made a decision because in retrospect, I could tell you, let's say Germany does fantastically this winter. And then next year I can come and say, yeah. It was Germany, so obvious. It's so obvious, right? So in one, one level, you need to place those bets so that you can be honest with yourself and the world. Right. But in the other, it's like it, it allows you to make money if you're able to place a bet somehow. And like 99.99% of things, you can't place a bet. Like as in, and then the stock market is the place where you can place the bet. It's one of the money. very few right. places. Or, I mean, there are betting markets in Europe and the United States. They tend to be illegal. Right. So there's Betfair in the UK where you can bet on political things. Right. Like who you think is going to be the next leader of a political party or indeed Microsoft, actually, when Microsoft had their leadership thing. That was a betting market that you could you could put money on, um, but in you know for most things in your in your life you can't bet on anything. Is that a, like is is that like because when you start putting bets on stuff you're actually like it, you can impact the outcome as well in a way. A little like, bit. Like if you yeah. come out and you say like I Steve Coach think this is going to happen and there are things where you have an impact like you as an individual but like other individuals have an impact and so the moment they say. I think this is going to happen. Like it's a, it becomes like a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. To some degree, right. But it, it also, the market reveals knowledge, right? So you, okay. if you have a lot of participants pacing different bets, mm -hmm. the, the, the price reflects the knowledge, right? The price is information, right? People think money okay. is like a, something you spend, let's say, right? That's like the, the first order, what I think most people think of money, but it's, it's an, an economist would say that it's, it's information, it's price signaling that's going sort of backwards in time from the thing that, that ultimately gets bought. 
one of the things I found really interesting is like there's a few studies that show that uh, people who try to manage funds usually don't perform as well as like general index funds. Like there's this story, I don't know if it's true, of like Warren Buffett, who's like, I can, I'll take a bet that 10 years down the line, I can outperform anybody and you just put it on the S&P 500. And then 10 years later, he was just like better than, I don't know how many funds. Do you feel like, how do you think about that aspect well, of it? Where like, it feels like it's really hard to like over the long term to, to get it right. So I've been to Berkshire Hathaway's annual general meeting a couple of times. And I remember that bet. It was one of those long bets, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't remember the details, but it was a it was a bet with another hedge fund manager about outperforming the S and P five hundred. Um, most people cannot outperform the S and P five hundred. Absolutely, most people should just put their money in a you know very low cost ETF or something. Yeah, um, that's totally true. On the other hand. Uh, there are people that outperform the S&P right, 500, right, right, right. In, including Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, what I think Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett would say is that you have to remain rational, which is very difficult because most people are not rational at all. Um, and you have to remain rational surrounded by those people, right? Um, and on the other hand, you also only have to be right once, right? I mean, there's a lot of people that bought Bitcoin early on and they don't have to outperform the S&P 500. They only have to make that bet once in order to, you know, check out from life. Right? So that the like time in market beats timing the market? No, um, what I'm, that's something slightly different. So uh, yes, you should put, yes, for most people, you should just put your money in, in an ETF and forget about it for 30 years. But there are also people who are able to beat it both over the long term and just by placing one or two bats. And if you all you do is sit around, I mean, like the the, the common thing people say about Buffett is that he's he sort of reads reads all day for 364 days of the year, right? And then he makes one decision, which you know is slightly glib, but it's also approximately true, right? You just spend an awful lot of time thinking, and then you place place a big bat, you know. Let's talk maps a little bit and stuff like that. Do oh yeah, have, this is a maps podcast. Right? <laughs> Do you have like prediction? Like one of the cool things about these recorded conversation is that they are a way to place a bet. We mm -hmm. don't bet anything, but I can come back 10 years and be like, hey, Steve, remember that conversation we yeah. had? <laughs> what What are some of, do you, do you have, like, do you think about those things about the, the geospatial, the mapping world, that there's whatever we want to call it? like where things are, are going. So we're in, in 2022 for people who are watching in 10 years. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts kind of on like where things well, might be going? To touch on your earlier question, I mean, I, I'm happy being wrong. I think most people are not yeah. happy being wrong. That's a big thing. Totally happy being wrong. And I don't really care, right? Because when you're, when you're, if you learn that you're wrong, it means you've learned something, which is much more valuable than sort of social emotional pressure to be, to be right. And I also think in terms of probabilities a lot, right? And there's good books on that, but it's not about what's going to happen in the future. It's about what what are the probabilities given a bunch of things, right. right? So you can say that, you know, people are going to go to sleep in their electric cars, but it's predicated upon wide deployment of electric cars, government regulation, uh, the ability to have, you know, beds in a car as, as opposed to mm -hmm. forward facing mm -hmm. seats. There's a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen. And if any of those doesn't work out, then going to sleep in your electric car isn't going to work out. So to come back to your question on maps, I think maps are going to disappear. That's my basic bet. I think two major things are going to happen. One is automation of maps, right? So if you made a, if you made a map today, would you pay 10,000 people to run around a country and collect data? No. Would you get 10,000 or a million volunteers to go and make a map, which is what OSM is? Probably not. But what you could do is you could, through automation, make a map, right? So if you think about Tesla has a few million, whatever it is, deployed yeah. vehicles plus a million every year now. If you just took the camera feeds, I mean, they have eight cameras on it. They aren't RGB cameras, but they're pretty good, right? Um, you, you could take all of the video and all the GPS and even user feedback, and you could take all that data from every Tesla car, make a map in with a, I don't know, a day's worth of data, a right. week's worth of data, which would be completely fine. And, you know, Tesla, when when cars are ultimately self-driving, there's some interesting things when the constraints change on maps. Like 
when you're in a car and you're driving around and the car says, hey, turn left on Main Street, you don't need need to know about turning left on Main Street when it's driving itself, right? Which means the car doesn't need to have road names, right? Right. And that's a fundamental thing in maps. Now, I know you do want road names for some other reasons. You want it for geocoding. You might want something else. But that relaxes the constraint. If you can make a map of the Western world or the drivable world, let's say an automotive map, and you don't need road names, your job just got about 100 times easier. Right. Right. Even though they probably can get road names because they'll have enough camera images to automatically recognize it. But that's just one one thing. And that's like a vestige of like the past of like, oh, exactly. look, it's this thing that exactly. we've kept. So you always have to like start and say, hey, if I'm, if I'm here doing this today, what would I do? Right. Well, most it's like in Peter Till's uh, in the book Zero to One, right? Yep. Going from zero to one is really difficult. Most people are incapable of that. But what you can, most people can do is go one to N. So if I give you something, if I give you a map or I give you a glass or I give you anything, you can make it a little bit better or you could make it a little bit lighter or you could make it a little bit cheaper. You can do these incremental things. But what's hard is to go back to the fundamentals and say, hey, how do I get, given my knowledge today, what would I do? Right. And someone in my position would probably sit around talking about how we should make OpenStreetMap 2% faster or something. But that's not how you build the future. That's how you build the past right? Right. or make the past slightly more efficient. So the, the way I, I feel like, let, let me see if I understand that, is like basically maps today are made for humans. And so that's why we have street names, because people remember I don't know, Washington Street better than 12834 Street. And so we're we're making them for people that they can remember it. But if people aren't the like audience for that, the, the people who use it, we don't we can make maps for computers. Well, exactly. And people are important, don't get me wrong. So you, you should always start with people. People yeah. then ideas, then machines, not the other way around. People get that wrong all the time. And I didn't make that up. I, I can talk about who I stole that from. But the other thing about maps disappearing, let me just come back to that. Um the story, like a good analogy is spell check. So spell check in the, I don't know, let's say 80s, spell checking a document was a paid feature, right? <laughs> Having a, a dictionary was a thing, right? right? So there's a book on the diffusion of innovations that this is a good example of, right? So it's an innovation and it's a paid feature. And then it becomes a paid, well, it's a paid product in and of itself. People used to buy dictionaries, like a CD-ROM with a dictionary on it in the 90s. That was a thing. Then dictionaries became part of, they just become features of a product. So, you know, Microsoft Word had a dictionary in it. Might not have the word definitions in it, but at least had all the strings so you could spell check, yeah. right? Slightly different. Then it just becomes built into every app and then it becomes built into every keyboard. And now every time you type on your phone, it has a dictionary and a grammar checker and it's all just built in, right? So there's this, this diffusion, this dispersion of this innovation. And what happens is, is that the, the price goes down dramatically, like it drops off a cliff over time uh, to the end consumer anyway. And then uh, it just sort of disappears and you don't even think about it anymore. And you can chart maps are going to be exactly the same. They are exactly the same, right? So maps, I don't know, three, four, five hundred 500 years ago were this extremely expensive bespoke thing that you paid a guy to make and you hung up on your wall to show the other lords and ladies and esquires, whatever it was that, you know, I am a rich person and I have a, you know, gold printed map of Terra Nova or something. And now they go through. So maps become, uh, I don't know, an item of exclusive, you know, status, status. Yeah. Then they become utility. So for most of my life, maps were utility, right? So you, you buy a map because you need to get somewhere. You buy a map because it, it helps you achieve some other goal, right? Um, then maps become entertainment. So if you can think of OpenStreetMap as basically mapping for entertainment, most people editing OSM are doing it for fun. They're doing it because they love right. maps. They're not doing it because they're on the front lines and they need a map of the enemy positions, right? And, and it's like a life or death thing. They're doing it for, and for fun, right? Um, so you, you're going through these phases and then eventually maps will disappear. And what I mean by that is you can already see it. Like practically, I don't know, 80% of the apps on your phone have a map in them somewhere, yeah. right? And you don't even think about it anymore. And the map isn't really there for, like if you think you open Uber and you're looking at a map, for example, it's not there because they need to put the map in the app. 
right? It's there to make you feel better. It's entertainment so that you can see the car coming towards you. Um, but the car's coming towards you whether you're looking at the map or not, right? But it gives you a, um, a bunch of confidence in the app, right? So it's disappearing into the entertainment stage, into the emotional reassurance of what you're looking at. Mm. But then if you think about a, a modern car, they have a big screen. And what does it show most of the time? A map, right? Going back to Uber quickly, when you're looking at the map, there's lots of stuff happening in the background, right? So Uber or anyone like Uber, when you order a cab, they're doing thousands of routes to fi figure out the correct car to, that's both going to come to you. But then after it drops you off, what is it going to do? And it, there's enormous amount of activity happening on the map, right? Even though it's just showing you this very simple thing. In the same way, when you, when you buy a car today, it's showing you the map, but there's lots of interesting things happening in the background. But the reason it's showing you a map is that because you're driving the car. And so you need to try and figure out where you're going. You need context, right? In the self-driving car world, which is really not far away at all, you don't need a map on the screen anymore. So you can use that real estate for something much more interesting, right? Which is difficult because a lot of people can't stare at a screen for long in a car because you get motion sickness. Right. So you, you'll either use that screen for something else interesting or there just won't be a screen at all, which is probably more likely. So I don't know. You asked about the future. <laughs> I, I think those two things, I think maps are going to be automated and that's a good thing. We replace a lot of humans with spreadsheets or whatever, and we just make these maps automatically. And then uh, I think maps are just going to diffuse and become part of the background radiation of the universe. Right. I like the uh, example of the dictionary, like the ultimate goal is to communicate better, like to, to talk to people better, like that's just the, the goal of, of what we're doing. So dictionaries are like, they're just a tool that you basically use to better communicate with people, like you want to know this word, things like that. And maps are just the same thing, right? They're just a tool that you use to get from A to B. And so if I understand correctly, you're saying it's like, it is a tool, but it doesn't have to be the tool. Like it, 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 we don't need to continue to interact with it. Like, cause people just care about getting, getting from A to, to B. Do you feel like at some point maps are just going to be this thing where like younger people come in and they're like, this is grandpa stuff. Like you have a car, you have a, a map somewhere and it's just this, like the way we look at VHS and or I look at VHS at least. <laughs> I hope and, so. Yeah. I hope so. I mean, the story of civilization is making tools and automating them, right? That's the whole thing. Like the wheel was a machine. These microphones were a machine. You know, maps ultimately are, are just tools and machines to accomplish some other goal, right? And like, I'll, I'll take issue when you say go from A to B. I don't want to go to B. I usually want to go to a person or I want to go to a thing. That's a good point. And we have this... Uh, like a good example is the addressing system. So in the Western world, we have street names, right? And then we have house numbers on them. So when I, I get a package delivered to my house, I tell them I live at 123 Main Street or something, right? But I the reason we have that is just because location technology kind of sucks, right? What would be perfect is my phone is tracking me the whole time. I could share that information with FedEx and FedEx could could deliver the package to Steve. That's what I really want, right? Not always, like a, if I might want a big package dropped at my house or something, but for like, I don't know, 80, 90% of things, I want you to deliver to Steve, not to an address. And we just use an address as a proxy system, a kind of, you know, and it was great for 18, 12 or something, but in 2022, you'd think we've come up with some better solution. And it's a very hard problem and it involves a lot of maps, right? Because Steve is constantly moving, the van has, 300 other things that it's trying to deliver to other yeah. people. It's a huge combinatorial problem, but ultimately it'd be way better if, uh, you know, I got on the plane, I fly to Amsterdam, I forgot my USB charging cable. Right now, how would I buy one, right? It's very painful. Maybe I get one at the airport for a hundred euros. Maybe <laughs> yeah. I can yeah. find one wandering around Amsterdam. Yeah. But yeah. why can't I just go on Amazon, order one and they deliver it to me? And I just share my location with them. And I can say, look, you can disturb me between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. And just come and find me and give me a cable. And I'll pay a premium for that, 
right? Because I'm busy and there's things to do. But ultimately, right now we use the addressing system, which is great 80, you know, 70, 80, 90% of the time, but it has all kinds of failure modes yeah. that we don't think about because it's, I don't know, part of the fabric of reality, right? It's grandpa stuff, as you said, right? Hopefully we get rid of it and there's something a bit smaller. That's how we met this morning, which is what I'm thinking about. Like, we just shared location. Like, this is where I am and you just walk around rather than like, I'm at the Starbucks mm -hmm. and then you have to, you're kind of tied to that thing, but there's no reason to be tied to it. Like, right. you can just walk around while you wait for someone and they will always find you, like, if you share that. Like, right. I mean, it's still day one, right? That's what Amazon likes yeah, to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still very early. Yeah. Like, if you had decent location to sharing technology, you could even nudge people a little bit. So, like, let's say you're going to be in Madrid in two months and I'm going to be in Madrid in two months as well, but we're in slightly different places. But there should be systems that say, hey, you're both going to be in Madrid. If you just shift, if one of you shifts a little bit, you can both get lunch or something, right? Yeah. Those kinds of use cases become possible that aren't today. Right. right? Most social media is focused on text, right? Because that was the easy first thing. Then the social networks were, were focused on pictures because that was the second easiest thing after phones came out, right? Um, we haven't really had a decent location-based social network yet. I mean, there's Foursquare, there's Zenly, there's bits and pieces of, of That's that. That's dead now. Well, yeah, there's bits and pieces of this story, Yeah. right? But you can imagine a world where, you know, you relax the constraints a little bit, you you use technology as it as it actually exists, as opposed to just assuming that we, you can't change the world, you know? So let's go on that a little bit. Do you think there's incentives to make like a location-based social network? Because then you're like offline, like the moment you meet, or at least I would, maybe it's me thinking, you know, like we need a faster horse and when it's like, it's going to be different. Like you, but I, I feel like the, the incentive, like if it's still text, if it's still an image or a video or like audio or something like that, you're still using the, you're still consuming it through whatever platform you're, you're, um, you're using it through. Like there's this notion, I'm, I'm curious what you think about that as well, where of like the attention economy, where like if you can hold people on that platform, that's where you make the money. Like if it's location and you're like, all right, let's get two people together. They don't need you anymore. They don't need whatever app you, you have. But that's going to happen anyway. I mean, so think of any platform from the 90s. It's all disappeared, right? So Windows was the platform of the 90s. It disappeared. Now you can have, you know, a, a perfectly functional equivalent in Linux or Mac OS, or for most people, their phones, right? So even saying that is a dumb thing to say, because I'm from the generation of desktop computers, which is retarded, because most people spend most of their time on mobile, right? Yeah. And I would say that Android is functionally equivalent to iOS, right? So there's that. Uh, the story of these platforms is that they, they tend to become irrelevant. Like Microsoft and others fought massive wars over the web browser, but the web browser is now practically irrelevant. All web browsers are approximately equivalent. They all do password saving. They all have favorites. I mean, most of them even use the same rendering engine now, right? So it disappeared. It used to be very important if you used Internet Explorer versus, you know, Netscape or something. Now it, it doesn't matter what browser you use at all. So I think over time, the same thing will happen with social networks. I mean, it happens with every platform. Like mm -hmm. I, and that's, you know, if you if you look, you can see that they know that. That's why, you know, Facebook slash Meta is spending so much money on AR um, and why Snap is spending so much money on AR and glasses and other things. It's because they know there's a limited amount of time to these things, right? Do you think those, like I listened to uh, Zuckerberg's interview with, with Rogan recently and like half of that interview is about AR and VR and about like, one of the cases that he makes is you can live anywhere and still have like decent meetings. Like they were recording in a podcast. So the same here. And they were saying like, there's no reason why we need to be here. We could, if we have like high fidelity stuff, we could just still do that. To me, like hearing that and putting it back to what we're talking about, it feels like you're completely removing like the spatial component as well. Uh, but then there's like what Snap is doing with like glasses and things like that, which is just like enhancing all the spatial stuff that you're doing. Do, do you have some thoughts about that? About like, is it, do you think like one is going to disappear where we're not going to go to places and just because the world can come to you? Or is it the other going to be like the other way around or, or just both? 
So the first use cases on anything new tend to be terrible, right? So the first use cases for NFTs that people have been throwing out there are like tickets, right? Or owning a JPEG. But those things are really proxies for social interactions, right? So I put a, I have a ticket in my, NF, I have an NFT that is a ticket. The ticket is what the thing I actually care about, right? Because I'm going to some conference or some social event, right? Owning a particular JPEG is not the thing. It's that you're part of a social network, right? Owning mm -hmm. that JPEG means that I get access to a Discord or I get invited to a certain party at an NFT conference or something. So they're all proxies for social interaction. So the first use cases for AR, this idea that I'm going to sit in a meeting and I'm going to be a dolphin on the moon while having a meeting for someone. I mean, these are just like, this is like when the Mac was introduced in 84, right? And they just like, people do desktop publishing and they just throw every font on the on the yeah. piece of paper, right? Because they didn't know what else to do. Like, like, let's just throw it all in there. So I think those first use cases are going to be necessarily terrible and silly, but uh, we'll eventually get to good ones. Um, it is deeply ironic that they're talking about uh, location being irrelevant, but both going to Austin to have a podcast, right? I mean, it's like <laughs> missing the point. But on the other hand, uh, what it really does is it enables, you know, the bottom 5 billion people or something who can't afford to fly, you know, in their private jet to go and have a meeting, to go and have some proxy of that, right? So like, it's not that... <laughs> You know, when the mobile phone came out, when that was a brand new innovation, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't just a phone without a wire, right? What it let people do, like the principal value early on in mobile phones was it let contractors, you know, plumbers, painters, everyone who had to be mobile, it allowed them to be um, vastly more efficient. Right. It wasn't for use for people sitting at home to call grandma. It was this new use case that I'm a painter and I need to go somewhere or I need to buy some paint and I can uh, phone my customer while I'm moving as opposed to having to go to the office to go do it. And then it became, and then the phone disappeared, by the way, right? Who uses, who actually calls anybody on their phone anymore? Nobody. It disappeared, right? Because we figured out all this other stuff. Um, but that took a long time. Yeah, it does. Like it was a big bet as well. Like the, the conversations around like the early design of should the first iPhone have a touch screen and being like, well, people use a keyboard, but they're not going to be using a keyboard all the time. And that being like a huge bet that like in retro retrospect, you're like, yeah, of course. But, but that took the, like, it's so interesting to go over like, how big of a bet that was back then for things that now we're like, okay, but that, I think it goes back to requiring having that, I would say maybe vision about like being confident that we're not going to need a faster horse, but we're going to need a car, which is, you know, this Ford uh, quote. Um, one of the things I, I, I think about when I hear you about that is how it feels like you're pretty detached when you're saying like, oh yeah, maps are going to die. Like if there's anybody who should care really deeply about maps, it's you. Um, I think OSM just turned 18, like not so long ago, if I, if I understood correctly, like that's a long time. And that's like turned into this massive project, which I actually do want to get at some point. Um, but, and yet it feels like you can talk about it in a way where like, yeah, that's, it, it's if it has served its time and then we move on to something um that's fine like it I, i'm i'm in a way i'm quite impressed at how detached you can be from that like, how do you think about that like or am i getting the wrong impression i don't think so i mean obviously the present is important right and osm is interesting and did a bunch of things but it's it's about uh i mean there's a, a number of thoughts come to mind we're all going to die right yeah. It's going to happen way quicker than anyone thinks. And then nothing's going to matter. Right. You're gone. Like uh, Naval says, you're gone in two generations or something and nobody cares. Right. So there's that. You also, if you're, if you're embedded in the past or you're embedded in something like, like OSM, like something like that as the person who created it. Right. 
um, you're extremely limited, right? Your, your shelf life is pretty, pretty low, right? I mean, like if if all you're going to do, like, don't get me wrong, it's interesting to go do OpenStreetMap things, right? It's interesting to talk about OpenStreetMap, but if that's all you're going to do for the next thirty years, I mean, you know. It would be like just all you have to do is like time shift, pick something else from the past. Like let's say I was sitting around talking about wheels, right? There's this great innovation, wheels. I was core to the invention of the wheel. And then there's wheels everywhere. But the, the thing that's interesting about wheels is like, I don't know, carts or cars or bicycles or something, right? It's this high level things or like how the bicycle has reshaped the, you know, urban architecture of Amsterdam, right? There's all of these downstream things. So when I was a kid, I used to spend a lot of time on bottom-up systems, artificial life, cellular automata, and other things like that. Mm -hmm. And what they're about is these simple rules, and then you have emergent properties of these things. So, you know, a more a more normal example is the Great Red Spot on Jupiter, or I don't know, clouds or waves or something. Right? There's a bunch of water molecules in the ocean, but you get waves out of it. Right? Or uh, whatever, there, there are emergent properties of these simple systems, right? So the question for me is more like, hey, there's OpenStreetMap, what does that mean downstream? What does it mean that maps are free and up to date? Um, and what's next, right? If you put yourself in the future looking backwards, which by the way is a useful thing to do. I, I read or was told or something about um, some tribe or something that talks about the future in terms of walking backwards into the past, right? As Westerners, we think we're walking forwards into the into the future, sorry. Yeah, walking forward into the future, but we're not because you can't see the future. So you're walking backwards into the future. You can see what's behind you oh, is a much right. better analogy. That right? is very clever. So if you put yourself, I don't know, in 10, 20, 30 years from now and you abstract yourself and you think, hey, what is it going to look like? Right. Yes. Yes, it's going to look a little bit like the present. There's going to be some similarities, but it's also going to be fundamentally different. There's going to be big changes. There's big demographic changes happening in the world. There's big technological changes happening in the world. Um, and it's, I don't know. So th to me, all of that is much more interesting than just saying, hey, you know, OpenStreetMap's great. Let's make it 2% faster. Yeah. Let's fix addressing. Let's yeah. do this or that. Because OSM at the time was was not just radical because it was... You know, OSM is a collection of things, right? It's a it's some technology, it's a community, it's a legal framework, it's a different business model. It's all of these things at once. Um, and that was sort of the interesting thing was all of this change, right? It wasn't just about like a slightly better database, right? It's like, it changed not just the technology of mapping and how people created maps, but it also changed the business model of maps, right? You wouldn't have people like uh, Mapbox or something without something like OpenStreetMap, right? So those downstream things are the, the more interesting. And then what's going to happen next, you know? So, you know, it was great, but if, you know, there's a lot of reasons to be more interested in other things. Right. But still, I, I admire the way you're able to look at that. Like, I think it takes a lot to be able to say, okay, we did this thing and it was huge and it changed a lot of things. And to be able to still, like, it feels like a very rational talk that you're having about it. It's not an emotional one where it's like very tied to this thing where it's your baby and the, the heart of what you've made for so long. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot to learn from that uh, as well. And, and being able to still, it seems like you're very critical about like how can we still keep solving problems? The problems have changed now. And I'd like to go back later to like what those were in 2004 when, when OSM started. Sure. Um, but it, it, it's kind of fun because it reminds me like when I was younger, I was really into like World War II airplanes and I thought they were the coolest thing ever. And I spent so much time like years on forums about learning everything I could and it was awesome but it slowly started to feel like this is just nostalgia for an era that doesn't exist anymore and I can't really do much with this like I still think they're the coolest stuff out there but I, I slowly realized like this is not there's nothing we can't we can't improve the Spitfire. Like it makes no sense. It's like, it's 
from the past. It, it served its time and things like that. But the exciting stuff are like, what are the new airplanes that are being made today? And I felt like I had to do this conscious shift about like forcing myself a little bit to stop caring about that as much to try to get more excited about like what are the stuff now that they might not be as exciting because they're earlier generations and they're not quite there yet as you were uh, alluding to earlier. But I was seeing stuff from the past and being like, wow, this was amazing. But that's seeing back like, oh, like in hindsight, this was the coolest thing ever. But in the middle, it was just people trying to solve the problem for that. And I feel like I had to change, like shift how I thought about like, now I want to work on the, the coolest stuff and trying to solve today's problems. But that was just me like being interested in airplanes. I hadn't built anything. So yeah, I'm just, all I'm saying is like, it, it's, I find that pretty impressive that you're able to, to do that. But that wasn't wasted time, right? No. You, you learned a bunch of things, yeah. right? That you can mental models and stuff. Um, I mean, I happen to, happen to think I know quite a lot about some of those things as well. And to me, the thing that comes to mind, I mean, this is departure from the topic again, but is just how, you know, modern fast attack aircraft are just a disaster, just complete garbage. And in some ways are anachronisms. And, um, yeah. you know, the golden era was the basically the F-15 and the F-16 and the A-10. And then when they got combined into the F-35, which is what John Boyd, who I'm a big fan of, John Boyd was a US Air Force, I'm going to say captain. I don't remember his rank, but he uh, was a, a strategist. Okay. Would be a good way to put it, although that's that's not a not a fair description. He was a lot of things, a very smart guy, um, and he fought within the Department of Defense to try and kill multi-role aircraft because you can't be a fast attack jet and a bomber and and do close air support all in one, which is what the F thirty five attempts to do, and it's much easier, much cheaper. Um, and much better to have separate aircraft. So the A-10 is a close air support anti-tank aircraft, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it has big square wings, mm -hmm. um, two engines at the back, massive visibility, just like the F-16. Um, the F-16 or the, I think it was called the lightweight fighter project in the beginning, something like that. Um, extremely maneuverable, fast energy transients as, as they would have said back then. And you have these two different aircraft, right? But if you try to combine things, if you try to have like a sports car, which is also a truck, you end up with something that's not very good at either, right? Which is effectively what happens and it's what the F-35 became. And the F-35 appears to be a complete disaster. Um, but we're still buying them and they're still incredibly expensive mm -hmm. and everyone's betting on them, which is, uh, you know, entertaining. I guess the saving grace is that no one's able to compete with our, our terrible aircraft because <laughs> their aircraft are even more terrible, <laughs> which might be the, the answer here. Um, but yeah, you, you have these interests and then they serve as contexts for, exactly. for other things, right? I feel I, like they've become frameworks to think about stuff. Right. The whole mental model thing that's doing the rounds on Twitter again, it's like Charlie Munger all over again. Yeah. One of the things I found really interesting and, and why I talk about this like emotional attachment is there was, so back when like, still airplanes, but like, um, pilots were like a huge thing. And there was this talk about every few months, like the allies got a better plane and then the Axis got a better plane. And it was kind of like one upping that, but there were pilots who were sticking to like older generations of planes or things like that. And who were like incredibly good and better than their aircraft. And I felt like there was this sort of, well, it's not sort of, it's like romanticizing the human aspect of it. And it's, where I found it harmful was that like looking back at that and being like, oh, the pilots were incredibly skilled and everything. And there was resentment in a lot of people about like, oh, the computer flies the plane now and it's not the same and things like that. To the point where people were like holding on to um, unmanned aircraft and like that the future war just wouldn't have a pilot. To the point where like the latest Top Gun movie opens up like that. It's like, oh, this project is going to get closed down because they don't want pilots anymore. But there's this romanticizing of like the people in them. And I felt like in order to move forward, I, like, I had to let go of that aspect and be like, what's the 
problem that this thing is trying to solve. Um, and then if you still like flying, it's just like if you still like mapping stuff, you can still do that. But be very aware of why you're doing it about like it's entertainment or it's like for fun, but not trying to pretend that like this is the better way to, to solve the problem. And I feel like that really stuck with me, like moving on to the things I do now and how I think about stuff about like being able to say like, is this just the same thing where I'm just too attached to wanting to be the solution of that? Where in reality, the, pro the problems moved on. I, I talked to, I went to a conference and I, I asked the, the test pilot of the A380 which turned out to be a pretty big disaster for Airbus as well. Like, did he think we were ever gonna have like fly up planes that fly themselves? And he was like outraged that I even asked the question. It was like, that's the dumbest thing ever. We need test pilots. Was he French? <laughs> uh, maybe. <laughs> I won't comment on that. <laughs> okay, so yes. <laughs> um, and and I, I remember that like moment sticking to be like, you like you're from a different time. Like you just, it's just, it remembers sticking because it was like, he was outraged even at the question. And like, that is the mental model I'm, I'm keeping with me about like these old airplanes and how we think about tech today. But it, it's beyond that. I mean, like, so most technology revolutions aren't really about uh, making something better, right? They're about replacing it. So to me, I mean, the A380 is a disaster on so many levels, but just like long distance flight is a disaster. Why, why aren't there bunk beds, right? Why do I have to sit in a seat? Why can't we have bunk beds, right? That would be a hundred times better if I had a bunk bed. It would, it would volumetrically, I'd take the same amount of, of volume in the main cabin, right? Um, probably nearly. Um, so hopefully that whole thing, I mean, the very, the, the idea of automated flight, whether it's commercial or military, is sort of missing the point in, at some level. Like automating commercial flight will only solve a tiny fraction of the problem. It's the two guys at the front or yeah. on an international flight, the three or four guys at the front. It doesn't solve having to go through airport security, having to go to a special place called an airport, um, the experience of having to sit in a seat for 17 hours. It's all of that other stuff. Hopefully that goes away, right? If if trains weren't illegal like they are today, if we could build new trains or something like that, then maybe we'd have vastly better trains or I could sleep in my self-driving car. Those would be way better, right? right? It's like making meetings better. Like, you know, let's have bagels in the meeting room or something versus Zoom. So I don't even have to go to the meeting in the first place, right? It's like obviating the thing. And then on the automation of military aircraft, Boyd had this thing that he repeated and repeated about people first, then ideas, then machines. If you have great people, they will lead to great ideas, which will lead to great machines, right? And we usually get it wrong, and that's why the F-35 exists, right? It's like we fell in love with the idea of the machine that would just sort of magically do everything, that we made this Rube Goldberg contraption where it has like a fan at the front and an engine at the back, and then, you know, all the stuff hanging off of it. And you have these very sort of orthogonal constraints, right? Like, so if you, if you want to make an aircraft that can turn really quickly, then you want a large wing area and you want to have high wind, wing loading. You need to have a, you know, pounds per square inch that are very high, or I don't know, newtons per square meter or something that are very high when you're turning so that you can throw the air around yeah. so that, you know, as an example of, you know, third or fourth generation fighters, that's how you do it. Today, you might use thrust vectoring or something to turn around. Yeah. So you want a big wing with high loading if you're turning, right? But if, you're, if your aircraft is a VTOL, right, if it can take off vertically, you want a very small wing because the wing gets in the way of all the air that you're trying to throw, right? So you have direct, you know, directly opposed constraints and you end up with this, you know, a camel, right? Camel is a horse designed by committee. Um, <laughs> the problem with drones is that then they abstract everything away, right? And they're like, I can press a button and kill people, which is not... Yeah which is very convenient for the person pressing the button, Not but really. ultimately it means that you're losing that fingertip feel for the battlefield if you're just thousands of miles away inflicting carnage on people. Like there's a time and place for drones. It's totally fine. It's probably how things are going to go, but I think we'll learn that in the end it was probably a bad idea. In the same way that the Ukrainian war is proving that maybe investing all those in all those tanks was probably not the best idea. Mm. If I can make a you know, shoulder-launched weapon that can destroy a tank, and I can deploy 20,000 of them, right? And have just have guys ha hiding in trees and buildings and, 
you know, destroying your 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 armor, then uh, you sort of don't want tanks anymore, right? So there'll be these things that will come out that make, I don't know, they'll change the nature of warfare, right? It's another one of those things we think, like a drone is just a plane without a pilot. Like, well, it's not. It has a lot longer endurance. It has higher G. It means I can control it. I can deploy them anywhere on the planet. Like, if you think about it, I could put a drone on an orbital platform and have it just drop anywhere in, in, in 90 minutes, right? Or less on the entire surface of the planet, right? So there's all these th things that drop out of it um, that are interesting, I don't know. Let's go to 2004. 2004. What... Um... What was the situation like? What 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 was what was you like? What were you like? But what was the like mapping like? How did you decide like I'm gonna start mapping stuff? Did did that even start like that? Well, you asked a lot of questions. I was <laughs> okay. What happens in two thousand four? <laughs> I was a lot younger, a very different person. So I was working either at the Center for Advanced Spatial Analysis, which is part of, I think it was part of geography at UCL, or or it was the VR Center, or some combination of the two, which is part of the Bartlett. So when I was an undergraduate, I, I worked in a number of uh, research departments, primarily looking after computers and doing researchy fun visualization things in the summer. And, you know, I'm sure it was different back then, right? Because the lens of history changes things. But my memory sure. is that I was sort of surprised that you couldn't get access to map data. Even as a, as a academic institution, it was very difficult to get access to map data. Okay. Because it was this proprietary thing. Um, and it just seemed to me that looking at Wikipedia or Linux, you have these complicated environments that ultimately lead to a bunch of open source bits sitting on a disk, right? And if you could do that for encyclopedias and you could do that for an operating system, why couldn't you do that for mapping? And it was all very contentious at stuff at the time, believe it or not. You know, there are plenty of people that told me this was impossible, would never work, yada, yada. And what was interesting to me is that there were other projects at the same time doing the same thing, but they tended to take the approach that we're going to have, you know, mapping professionals go do this, but they're going to do it somehow for free on the internet. Right. Um, or we're going to, they typically said, Hey, we're going to focus on one data set in one geography. Right. So there was one that was mapping, footpaths in the UK, Nick Whitelegs project. And there was one mapping roads in Israel. That was freemap.il that became Waze, right? And so the the innovation in OSM wasn't, hey, let's get, get people to do stuff for free necessarily. It was, let's take a customer focused approach. <laughs> That's what you call it today, maybe. And then let's, let's let people map anything anywhere. And then let's rip the bandaid off and just let them do it. Because most of the in fact, I think all of those projects had some sort of layer of authentication. No, authentication is the wrong word. Uh, verification, right? You couldn't just go in and edit something like you can in OSM. You had to submit your changes. Someone re would review them and somehow get them into some sort of complicated system, right? But if you lower the barrier to entry, it changes everything. And so that simplicity was what drove the project was that, you know, the API is very simple. It wasn't in the beginning, you know, it was XML RPC and other horrible things from the past, monsters in the deep. Um, but it evolved towards more and more and more and more sim simplicity. And, you know, the wonderful thing, by the way, is that OpenStreetMap's data model, um, although it had some tweaks, right, with relations would be one thing that was added. Um, and it also evolved over time when I was in charge of it. But it's incredibly simple and the same API, the same data model, and essentially the same software. It's not really quite true, but at some level, it's the same software that it was in, let's say, 2007, something like that. The point that it evolved to has continued. Um, and that's why this, it, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, inside baseball, but there's proposals inside OpenStreetMap right now to change the data model 
and it's like let's take the <laughs> let's take the best thing and let's let's see if we can change it and see what happens like yeah good luck um but it was a different time and th the thing evolved a lot right so the open street maps you see today although in many ways looks identical the the API looks identical and stuff to 2007 or whenever the you know 0 0.6 came out the API version I don't remember um there was an enormous amount of innovation and stuff that happened in the beginning. It was like this horrible Java project with XML RPC that evolved into the thing that you see today. Like there were Java applets. It was it was uh, whatever the Java enterprise runtime stuff on the server was called, and all that stuff is gone. Um, but the idea was there. And what I did was I just did lots and lots of talks. So in the beginning, I did everything, right? I wrote the server software. And primarily I wrote the server software because nobody else wanted to do it. Everyone wants to work on the human facing piece, right? The map editor, making pretty display maps, printing them out. But writing the the database code was the most annoying piece that nobody wanted to do. And it just so happened that I had spent a lot of time writing very large SQL queries back then. Um, so I did all that boring stuff. That was one thing. I also ran the mailing lists. Um, I ran the IRC server back when IRC was a thing, another piece of ancient history. Um, what is that? Yeah, exactly. What is IRC? So there was a time before Slack. Let's put it that way. Um, really? Yes. <laughs> IRC was like Slack, except um, there were no pictures and there was no history. And, you know, it was like, IRC was like a terrible version of Slack. How about that? Um, uh, so I did all of those things. And then one of the one of the really important things that I did that really came out, I think, in that book that I did, the book of RSM thing, mm -hmm. um, was I also did all the marketing. Well, what today we'd call the marketing. I didn't think of it as marketing at the time, but I, I did a lot of talks. So I spoke, at OSM, I spoke about OpenStreetMap on the order of 500 to 1,000 times, something like that, um, literally, no exaggeration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I did that at Linux user groups. Back then there were these things, back, Linux was relatively new even in 2004. Um, and there would be user groups that would talk about cool Linuxy things, right? I'd speak at those, I'd speak at mapping events, um, open source conferences. And it was all about sort of two things. One was evangelizing OpenStreetMap and getting people on board with the idea. And that was relatively easy because a lot of those open source people, they, they grok the idea very easily, yeah. but they, they hadn't seen a project that was open source that got you out into the real world, right? It was sitting at home and working on an open source piece of code or something, but OSM was you going out and doing things. So there was sort of that angle. There was also geocaching was big back then, things like that. Um, but it was also about collecting feedback. So going and showing OSM and then people saying, well, OSM is terrible because of X or Y or whatever, and then going and trying to fix it and trying to make it better. Um, and through those two things, sort of iterating a lot of things so that the talk was iterated. I would always ask people, you know, what would you change in the talk that I gave? Like people would say, well, the font was bad or like using the, de using the default font in uh, any of the presentation software is a bad idea. You know, you learn these little things just by talking to lots of people. So um, what should we change in the talk? What should we change in the software? Um, what should the data look like? That kind of thing. And then going back and trying to implement this. And that was the beginning, right? And this is all very Steve-centric, but as the, as the mm -hmm. thing progressed, lots and lots of people got involved and did all kinds of crazy things with OSM and, and helped both build the software and spread the word and build the data, right? And it, it took off on its own after that you know i did the i did the first conference or i named the first conference there are a lot of people that helped in the beginning as well yeah. of course like setting up the foundation you know although I, I i did that it was with a lot of people and the same with setting up the conference um the same with the license change you know which is ancient history now but was a massive deal back then i want to get to like some of those but first i want to ask like why do you think OpenStreetMap worked? Like, why is it the like open map now? Because you said there were other projects before. Why is it not those projects? I think the meta answer is that those other projects were 
rooted in the past. So those projects did things like, um, what they attempted to do was take the old model of making a map and put it online. And you can still see this today, right? Like what people, if you, by analogy, if you look at QGIS, right? QGIS is, a, is great, it's useful and so on, but it's like a bad copy of Esri, right? At one level. Now people are gonna get offended by that, right? And it's not, I'm not trying to talk down to QGIS, it's yeah, more yeah. about how you think about things. Like let's talk about OpenOffice or LibreOffice or whatever they're yep. calling it this week, right? It's like at one level- Which is just a second text, like the free version of Word. The free version of Office. Of off yeah, the whole Office. Yeah, Sorry. it started yeah, yeah. as a German company, if I remember, Stardock, it was Star Office. Then it got open sourced as to OpenOffice, then it became LibreOffice. But anyway, it's like a bad copy of Office 95. And Office 95, Microsoft left Office 95 a long time ago. There's a lot of things that have changed in Office that haven't changed in open source because what you're doing is you're looking in the past and then you're trying to copy it, right? Which open source is extremely good at and very efficient at and is great in a lot of ways, right? It's great that there's a free Office tool. It's great that there's a free GIS package, right? But that's a different thing from trying to create something new or trying to change how things work. So those, a lot of those projects that were like OpenStreetMap in the beginning, they were, they were great. They were well intentioned. The people behind them were, were, you know, all great. Richard Fairhouse was great. Nick Whiteleg was great. There was, um, you know, the, the ways people were great. Ways is slightly different because they were trying to do something a little bit new, especially later on, but they were basically taking the way that the ordnance survey would make a map and then trying to digitize that, right? Um, rather than democratizing the process, right? So in OSM, you don't have to wear a fluorescent jacket. You don't need an RTK GPS. We just let people run free, which in the beginning was super controversial. People would say, hey, how could you just use a consumer off the shelf GPS to make a map because it's only accurate to 10 meters, right? That was a common criticism in the beginning. And the answer was, by the way, well, a road is 10 meters across anyway, so the accuracy doesn't really matter. Um, so when you look at it through the, that lens, things are very different. And let me just make sort of detour and give you a short sure. analogy. Yeah. If you ask most people to draw a tree, okay, they'll draw a line, horizontal line, and then they'll draw the tree, right? And they don't, never ever does anyone draw the roots, right? And the reason you don't is you don't see it, right? And you don't think about it, but the roots are kind of important on a tree, right? It's where the you know where the water comes from, it's where most of the nutrients come from. It's also you know the reason the thing doesn't fall over. You know it's quite important, right? So when you look at the surface of something, when you look at the surface of Esri or something, you're going to end up with QGIS, right? If you look at Office ninety five, you're going to end up with LibreOffice, right? But if you start from the beginning and look at it a different way, and you say, hey, how am I going to get people to map for free? Right, as opposed to how am I going to get cartographers and geographers to contribute a little bit of data? It's completely different, right? So I'm gonna be on the internet. The tool is gonna have a very low barrier to entry. I'm gonna give try and give you immediate feedback, which in the future was not, in, in the past was not true. OSM, you made a little edit and it took a long time for the edit to show up, right? But reducing that down was very important. The quicker you can show feedback to someone, the more likely they are to go add more, right? And you end up with a very simple data model. Almost everything, I mean, even today, most people doing mapping, even when they build a new system today, will create some sort of vast complicated ontology and horrible data model with all kinds of inherent stuff in it. Because they think they're being smart, right? That's the computer science solution, right? It's like Google plus codes is what you would get if you throw computer scientists at geocoding, right? And they genuinely think that that's a good, good, good way to solve the problem, right? What three words is what you get if you have marketing people solve the problem, right? And that's not, absolutely not looking down at marketing people. It's actually the other way around. Like yeah. what three words has loads of benefits over, over plus codes. Both of them are also terrible at certain things, right? So these are all just analogies, but um, the reason that OSM took off, I think was just that focus on very short feedback loops and democratizing the whole thing and not assuming 
you need a qualification to go map or you need a, a special magic bright yellow tool like an RTK JPS or something like that. Was that like from the from day one? Like if it, it, it seems like that's a very strong vision to have to, to be like, this is what we're going to do is is the it, like today you'd say like the, the UX, the UI is very thoughtful about like the um, the user journey about like someone new comes in and like what it's like to do that. It's very focused around that. Was that something you thought of like from day one or like how did that kind of emerge? Because when I think open source, yeah, it's, it's really not the design that really stands out for a user. Um, it's very fun to bring in new people and, and to show them QGIS for the first time if they've if they've never seen it and they're like, wow, this is old in, in the way it looks and the way you use it and things like that. It's an amazing piece of software. I love it. I use it all the time. But there is that aspect. And but it seems like hearing you talk like the component of we need to make it as simple as possible is very rooted in the foundation of OSM. Yeah, because in the beginning I was making it for myself. Right. So I started off in computer science and then I transferred over to physics and computer science teaches you a certain way of thinking and physics teaches you a slightly yeah. different way of thinking. And it's very bottom up. Right. Elon Musk talks about this, like when when they was deciding to do rockets, you just look at the spot price of the metal that it requires to make a rocket. Right. What is a rocket? Well, it's a bunch of different metals. It's a bunch of fuel. Right. And it's some and it's some control computers. It's a bunch of Raspberry Pis. And it's a bunch of metal and a very good GPS, maybe, right? So if you look at the unit cost of a rocket in those sort of bottom-up physical terms, it's pretty cheap, right? But we think of rockets as expensive for a whole bunch of social economic reasons and, and, his, and history. But it's actually not something that should be super expensive or complicated to make. The first ones are... Right. The first, whenever you build the first of something, it's, it's usually expensive. There's that, right? But if you can get over them blowing up, which was the point, then you, then you can go make something very cheap, right? So with OSM, the analogy is, is, I think, is that if you just look at the amount of time people spent on Wikipedia, and back then Wikipedia was new, right? Today, people grow up with Wikipedia. They assume it exists. And, and trust it as well. I feel like that was a big one, the, the trust in it as right. well. When I grew up, like, not that old, but like it was starting to get there. But people were like, oh, don't trust that. Don't trust the internet. Like I felt like that was a big barrier as well. Right. And you shouldn't trust Wikipedia. It's terrible. If you spend any time on a topic, right? I like this. Like If you spend any time on any topic, let's pick a simple thing, clouds, right? I've never read a book about clouds. But I bet if you read, if you read, so nobody reads, right? Let's just posit that. But if you read one book about clouds, you're going to know more than, I don't know, 7 billion people about clouds, right? Give or take. You read two books about clouds, three books about clouds. Once you go down that rabbit hole and you're four or five books about clouds in, you can't even talk to people anymore because your, your vocabulary and your understanding means that you're so you're so far off to the right hand side on that graph or something that your your very vocabulary and understanding is foreign so you spend all that time on aircraft right you a kid could walk in here and talk about how cool the f-35 looks right you don't even have a vocabulary to explain to them why the f-35 is actually a disaster right it looks cool it does absolutely look cool and it has all kinds of things um but it's going to be very difficult for you to even have a conversation about the relative shortcomings of this or that, of the Spitfire versus the Hurricane versus the, you know, whatever, right? The zero. So, and that conversation is also irrelevant to most people, right? Um, because nobody cares. And I care about clouds, you care about planes, whatever it is. Um, I can't even remember where I was making that point. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I, but we were talking about like how Wikipedia was starting off. Um, mm. So that's the point I was trying to make. If you spend any time on any topic, and everyone has a topic, right? For you, it's planes. And then you go and read the Wikipedia articles, you're going to see it's full of holes and it's very problematic. So that was the point I was trying to make is, no, you shouldn't trust Wikipedia because, <laughs> because if you know anything about anything, you're going to see all these problems, right? Like I read the Wikipedia page about me and I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> it doesn't seem that accurate, but whatever. 
Um, but yes, there was there was like no trust in Wikipedia. I can remember I went to a talk in in the city of London when wikis were new, and there were mostly finance people there. And there was a guy at the front talking about this new technology called wikis that you could deploy in your organization. And the example that this guy gave was you you have an office admin and your office admin would go around and make sure everyone's phone number and address and whatever was up to date in, in the personnel database, right? And his example was, well, you could just have a wiki page where each individual could go in and edit and make sure that their phone number was up to date. And it would be a very simple, easy process. Anybody could do it you would free up the admin to go do something else. And then you could do this with other types of knowledge, right? And I was sitting through this, made total sense to me. He ended his talk, asked for questions, and someone put their hand up, one of the finance people, and said, this wiki stuff sounds incredible. I think we should deploy this. Um, but, you know, how can I make sure no one can edit anything? <laughs> that, was the, that was what the first question was of that talk. <laughs> And so uh, that was the reigning, that was, you know, the paradigm, that was how things worked, right? And that was wikis, let alone maps, right? So people absolutely didn't want anyone editing the map. Provenance is a problem, accuracy was a problem, right. all that stuff. But if you could see past that and you could see, hey, Wikipedia was working, Linux was working, um, we just need to lower those barriers to entry across the board because my customer, if you like, and these are not the words I would have used when I was 24, but um, my customer was not necessarily the end mapper as well. It was the map editors, right? So one of the reasons that OpenStreetMap has an extremely simple data model and API is so that you weren't pushing all the burden onto the people doing the UI UX. So when, when JOSM was being made, when other things were being made, it was so brain damagingly simple to talk to the API that you freed them up to go work on other better things, right? Um, and then that meant that there were more editors than there's a community of people out there all talking to the API, doing different things. And it's sort of like you abstracted the problem away. Like another, and a common criticism of OSM in the beginning, people would ask me, is like, why aren't you storing all the photos, right? Why don't you... When people are going around mapping, you could just have all the photos. It's like, well, it's quite a hard problem just making the API work, let alone going and building editors, which I, I mean, I, I was involved in some of the early editors, but I didn't, I didn't go and spend 24 months making JOSM or whatever it was, right? Um, you needed these layers and abstractions to let people go do things um, as simply as possible across the board. And that's what I, I think people continuously miss. And that's why this, these latest things about making the data models more complicated is just it's just nonsense and missing the point, right? The point is simplicity for all these multiplicative reasons, right? Come back to something we talked about earlier. It's like the F-16, one of the reasons the F-16 was so successful, because it's so cheap, it means I can train in it every day, right? I can go and put pilots in an F-16, they can go and train every day so that this stuff becomes normal. But when your fighter jet costs half a billion dollars, and you're not allowed to fly it, right? You can't train in the thing, right? Uh, so that has a sort of second order multiplicative effect of like, is this thing gonna be effective? Um, so that simplicity across the board was the, the key thing. And people hated that in the beginning. And so many of them still do. Why? Because it didn't allow them to do what they thought they should be doing. I mean, if you go through a computer science degree, or you go through a, a geography or GIS degree or something, you think that the world works through complicated ontologies yeah. and rules, right? There's a lot of people, most people in the world, they think that the world operates on a bunch of rules, right? And we just have to follow the rules and then everything will be okay, right? It's like sort of like a religious thing. Like I will be saved with a capital S as long as I follow the rules, right? Um, and unfortunately it's not really true. And so if you relax all of those rules, Right, like OpenStreetMap has an open tagging scheme, which means that you can uh, make mistakes when you're typing something in, right? Um, it means that, you know, most mapping systems in the world, even today, they have defined types, right? Like there is a freeway type, there is a uh, major building, road type, yeah. there is a point of interest type, right? So on. And OSM blew all of that up because folksonomies were working in 
there's another ancient piece of history called Flickr, which invented folksonomies. And uh, that stuff all worked, right? But it was, a, again, another abstraction that if I don't have to make the ontology for the world, which is basically impossible, right? If I just make that text and let anybody go and use keys and values, then, right. then you blow it up. And then that's a problem for the people working on it because you have to probably solve that at some point. Like, is, is, it, is, it, is the point like you remove the burden from the user and so that's how you scale and then, and then you go in the background and figure out if, you know, point of interest is with a space or with an underscore or stuff like that because that's what we're talking it's about. It's decoupling. Right. Right. It's focusing on the absolute simplest database plus API that will enable all of this stuff to happen. Right. If you if you take that as your burden, uh, you can you can be successful as a single you know a single person trying to drive in a direction. If you then take on the burden and say, I'm also going to de define a global ontology. <laughs> good luck. Yeah. Right? If you also say, well, I'm also going to be Flickr, and you also say, hey, I'm going to do all of the rendering because all of these were separable projects, right? There's yeah. Mapnik going off and doing rendering, but Mapnik wasn't the first map renderer. There were multiple others and there still are, right? Um, there were multiple tile servers. There are multiple editors. Um, there are even, if you think about it, multiple ontologies about how people map, right? And there's some accidents of history that we have like motorway in the UK as the, in, in OSM as the, the tagging schema. Um, but does it really matter? Yeah. No. And then for the editors, if you want to make an editor that abstracts all of this away, like ID does, right? And you just say, you know, I don't care about tagging. I just want to say that this is a road and it's called Main Street. You can go do that too, right? There's, uh, it allows all that stuff because there's very few rules. Because the more rules you put on the system, the the more brittle it's going to be, the more fragile, the less things that are going to happen, which is, you know, why why the thing was so simple. It's incredibly hard to make simple stuff though. Like to go back to computer science, like it feels like a lot of it is like just adding complexity and things like that. And there's this saying that, you know, if I had more time, I would make it simpler. Like how do you, how do you make some, or how did you make something simple? Like, cause it, it feels once you have a, a system that works, that's simple, it's, like easy to to see it but like again that's in hindsight like how do you design a system that works but that is inherently like very very simple like it feels like this is also like goes back to the cellular automata stuff like it's super basic rules but you end up with the game of life for example right well to be fair there was a lot of iteration in the beginning right like i mentioned osm began off as a horrible i think it was xml rpc and then it you know rest back then restful apis with this brand new idea right um so i think it was just cutting repeatedly cutting if that was it. possible and it sort of it got simpler we went down to uh, there were nodes and segments then it got a little bit more complicated with ways and relations um how do you make something simple i don't know but it's like cut that was right that's the thing like you you started it was not simple but like that was a priority to say like we got to make it right. simpler we got to not add stuff we got to remove stuff add lightness yeah add lightness. i think it, it's just about thinking you know to come back to your earlier question i think that if you go through a gis degree or at least back then if you went through a gis degree you think the world looks like right. something that looks like qgis right yeah. And yeah, there are that's rules. The new normal. Right. And you're a surveyor and you're going to wear a yellow jacket and you're going to be paid a lot of money, right? And you're going to take out specialized equipment and you're going to have a degree, right? And that's your way of thinking. And you, you inherit this from the past and you just think that this is how things are, right? And computer science is exactly the same, right? right. Although it's a faster moving topic, you think the world works a certain way and you end up with Google Plus codes, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if, you're, if you go through a physics degree, you're going to think about things a certain way. But even, you know, even physics has like all kinds of problems in it that we just sort of pretend don't exist, right? <laughs> and that was my problem with physics. But um, the, again, it's like people, ideas, machines, right? You, it's, you have to be very, very careful about how you think about things, right? It's very difficult. Michael Crichton wrote about this a lot in a book called Travels, that 
it's very difficult to take a step back and just look and just right. see. You always want to impose a model on it. You want to impose a set of thinking. And the world just doesn't work like that, right? But people would prefer things to be binary, right? Political person is good or bad, that's it, right? Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. global warming's definitely happening or you're a denier and that's it, right? And there, it's just, it's much better. I think a lot, I think people are much more comfortable not thinking about things first or secondly, hoping that they're simple. Which feels a little bit like a dichotomy. Like you want to make things simple, but the world, like there are like scales for, for, for things. Mm -hmm. So while preparing the interview, I looked up and I saw that you interned at Wolfram, like I think a few years before starting OSM. And um, I think Stefan Wolfram is the name of the- Steven. Steven, sorry. He has the same name as I do. Right, there we go. He's really big on cellular autonomy. Automata. Oh, God damn it. He invented half the field. Yes. <laughs> That's yeah. There we go. Sure. Do you think that was like, uh, that had an impact on like how you thought about it? Cause you've, you've brought it up, we've talked about like that. Do you think that way of thinking about like this fascination for like m very simple rules that make very complex things emerge was, was helpful in making OSM and in, in leading that? I think so. So when I, when I was a kid, when I was like, I don't know. 16, something like that. I read a lot of books on that, on those, on that set of ideas, right? So in the, in the eighties and early nineties, there was some cross disciplinary interest in bottom up systems, chaos used to be called chaos theory, now complexity theory, maybe cellular automata, simple rules, artificial life, all that stuff. Um, and what you learn from all of that is that you can build systems with extremely simple rules that have uh, enormous complexity out of them. And the surprise was that, you know, the thing that, that Stephen Wolfram, one of the many things that Stephen Wolfram did in one of his papers is try to classify what that complexity was, right? That there, if I remember correctly, it's you know, four classes of things. There's uh, things that just die. Right, so the screen. So if you think about a one-dimensional cellular automata, this is what he was doing. Um, these one, DC, one DCAs that would just go black, or they would go white. Right. So that was class one of the classes. I just I don't remember what the numbers were, but the, the thing would just die, and nothing interesting would happen. Then there was randomness. So you put in some initial conditions, and you just get random noise out. Right. Then. Uh, the other one was periodic. So you put something in and it would become this periodic, like on off TikTok like thing. Although the, the period wasn't necessarily two, the period could have been longer, I don't know. And then the, the, the class that was interesting was the com complex class that would make something that was not random, not periodic, didn't die, but was still very interesting, right? That's how we ended up with all those pictures of triangles. Um, Is that like 238? I forgot the number of... But like a oh, rule rule f I don't remember the rule numbers even. But right, yeah. that one where it's like half the page starts. Right. So the the search base, the the search base of the rules for the one dimensional cellular automata that he was doing with a neighborhood of two or three, including your previous state, um, is two to the three, which is eight, right? And then there are there's a choice per rule. So there's two hundred and fifty six rules from memory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And this is just for simple one-dimensional cellular automata. And he was trying, at least this is my memory, he was trying to abstract away all of the do different cellular automata and artificial life things that people were doing and get down to sort of the absolute most basic unit you could, which looks like basically one-dimensional cellular automata with a neighborhood of two or neighborhood of one, which I can't even remember the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then figure out what these classes exist and to what degree do they exist, right? Because in, in a, in a two-dimensional cellular automata where you get the, uh, the game of life coming out of something, mm -hmm. what you really want to know is not the game of life. Like the game of life is fascinating, gliders and glider guns, and you can make a computer out of it. So it means, which means it's true and complete amongst other things. But can you, um, how prevalent is this, right? Out of the rule space, how many of them lead to interesting behavior? And that's what, why it was reduced to one dimensions, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, so anyway, yes, it, it changes the way you think about the world. If you spend an enormous amount of time learning about these systems and how they work, 
it also means you can look outside and not be baffled by the complexity. I mean, most people must just look around and just be frightened <laughs> by the world and what's going on. And I, I don't entirely blame them. But if you if you can think in terms of these basic things, it gives you frameworks for thinking about stuff. And it's not just mathematics or physics. I mean, right. social scientists or psychologists would do the same thing. They'd be like, why is person X responding way Y? Well, if you have a psychology degree, I'm sure you can explain why they're doing that. And it's not some sort of big mystery to the world, right? Yeah. Do you think there's a, a way to um, push yourself to do that more? Like, is it reading more? Is it traveling? Like, about getting out of the way you're, you're thinking? Like, you, before we started recording, you said, you know, if, if you're a fish, you don't have a word for water. I, is there a way where if you're a fish, you go out and look for stuff like water? Have you found ways that work for you of, of trying to think differently? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of tools you can use. One that I use a lot is uh, thinking about potato prices in Lithuania. That's a really good one. I like that a lot. Okay. So if someone comes to you and they're sort of, well, you're talking to someone and people get upset about stuff all the time. Right. Or, or not necessarily upset is a strong term. People are concerned about certain things. And the way Nassim Taleb deals with this is to say, well, you should just read a newspaper from a year ago. Right? It doesn't even have to be two years ago, just a year yeah. ago. Read the front page, look at all the concerns, and then you can look back and like, did any of this matter? No, right? That's the way he, that, that he uh, I think in his books, maybe, on, maybe in person, talks about that as well. For me, it's something very similar as, you know, people are super worried about, I don't know, the price of oil, or they're super worried about uh, X or Y. And I just think, what about the potato price in Lithuania, right? If you're in Lithuania and you're a potato dealer <laughs> or you're a grocery store or something, then potato prices are deeply important to you. Oh my God, the price has gone up. Oh my God, the price has gone down or we don't have enough potatoes or whatever, right? Abstracted away, does someone in Lithuania care about the price of gasoline in Denver, Colorado, probably not, right? So the first thing is sort of to pick the direction where you're looking, right? Pick the thing that matters. Do the potato prices in Lithuania matter to me? No. And so reciprocally, does it matter whatever it is that I care about? Probably not. Right. So then you have to try and find something that actually matters. That was the next question. And then you have to try and see if you can change it, and you usually can't. So, you know, the, a very common one in the Western world, and you should be aware of this, right? The, the concerns of the Western world are not the concerns of the world. There are plenty of places in the world where nobody cares about the things that we care about or, or the West cares about. But a very common one is uh, climate change, right? It's a huge one. Um, and... Although I'm a dropout, I have a background in physics, right? And it's it's a super interesting one. So because most people don't really understand what's going on, uh -huh. and we defer um, we defer our thinking to experts, which we do all the time. Like when you go to a doctor, for better or worse, usually worse, you're deferring your you're deferring your decision making to someone who spent a bunch of time studying it, right? But that's super interesting because you can ask people, hey. Um, do you think the temperatures are going to be higher in 30 years or something? And people will say yes, right? Um, but that's actually a much harder problem to solve than it, it looks, right? And then you can ask, hey, do you know why the sky is blue? Most people don't know why the sky is blue. You can ask where the oxygen comes from. Most people say trees. It's not trees. And so automatically what we do is we try to make 30-year atmospheric physics predictions without knowing even the most basic of facts, right? which is exactly the point of Jurassic Park, right? It's like, we're, we're trying to mess with systems that we don't understand, and we have enormous confidence in ourselves to go mess with those systems, um, and also defer to experts. But the experts aren't always as good as, as they think they are, right? Jurassic Park is a great example. Um, and so really thinking through this is hard. And none of this, by the way, means that I'm a denier, right? I've just spent a lot of time on it. You can read the IPCC reports for free. The IPCC reports are frightening. 
like you, if you turn on the TV and it says, oh, we're thinking about one degree or 1.9 degrees, we're going to try and hold it here. Go read the IPCC reports. They're talking about four, five, six degrees, um, you know, soon. <laughs> so, so first of all, you, you find out, you go look, look in the direction. This is a problem. Everyone says this, this is a problem. And that's a good thing, by the way, because if everyone thinks it's a problem, it means there's lots of smart, highly paid people going and trying to fix it, right? Great. It means you probably don't have to worry about it because everyone else is already worried about it, right? Um, but then the next question comes is like, can you change it? And the answer is absolutely not. The amount of CO2 that's been put in the atmosphere is just absurd, right? So assuming that the IPCC is correct or approximately correct, can you do anything to change it? I mean, you might as well try and change the orbit of Jupiter. You know, that's the scale of the problem. Um, and I'd be very happy to be wrong, right? Maybe some of these technologies magically pull all the CO2 out. But the whole reason you put the CO2 in the atmosphere is, is because the energy goes in that direction, right? It's like physics or chemistry. It's like you're releasing energy by doing that. That's the reason we do it. And so it takes an enormous energy amount of energy to bring it back. And people think, well, we'll just plant some trees or, you know, trees aren't even a much of a net carbon uh, a sink for the atmosphere. You know, it's an enormous problem. I'm not going to solve it. I don't know. So therefore, should I care about it? Mm. No, but you know, what can I do? And that's juxtaposed with, you could say the same things about maps. You could say, well, look, you're 23, you're an idiot, you're dropping out of college. Who are you to say that you're going to change the way the world maps, right? So it's interesting juxtaposition because, you know, I did. People can change things. It is very possible. Um, and it's difficult to, to sort of see sometimes which ones you can fix and which ones you can't. How do you reconcile those two things, though? I think it's very difficult. I think it's very difficult. I think the the first thing is to at least have a deep understanding of the topic, right? So picking on global warming is not the point. Is not global warming yeah, or, yeah. or Steve's personal thoughts or whatever, right? It's just that it's a it's a common framework that we can have, right? We could talk about other things like the space shuttle, or we could talk about I don't know. <sighs> whether you should eat meat or potatoes or something, right? There's a lot of different frameworks that you can use, but it's about going a few depths down and spending time understanding a topic to try and see if the public perception is correct or not. And it's usually not correct, right? It's usually diametrically opposed to the actual reality, right? And it's usually about making ourselves feel better or whatever about something as opposed to actually solving the problem or social conformity by, you know, I agree with, you know, you you say, you know, oh, the weather in Amsterdam is bad. And I say, oh, yes, it's bad, right? And it's about us agreeing and forming social bonds because we're, you know, social by nature. It's not about the weather. It's not about the weather, no. So uh, I don't know, but I think the first thing is to try and deeply understand the topic. Did you deeply understand maps? At some levels, yes, because with my computer science hat on at the time, to me, it looked very simple. So if you imagine back then, Wikipedia's data model was very simple. It's, it's a, if you imagine looking at the, the SQL table for it, you have basically a timestamp or date time, right? For when the edit was made, mm -hmm. you have a user ID that's just, those are two of the columns, right? And then you have a text blob for the for the text. That would be like the absolute simplest sort of Wikipedia data model abstraction that you could make. There's a bunch of things that are not efficient about that, right? You don't want a new text blob every time. You might want to just store the diff and then have like the latest thing off to the side. Right? A little bit like Git maybe. Right, right. But the absolute simplest data model, that's basically it. Right. Mm -hmm. And if, and out of that, you get the world's knowledge, right? <laughs> Organized for free on a website. So, um, can you do the same thing with maps? Well, to me, it looked like, well, we've got points in space. Today, we call that a node in OpenStreetMap, right? And what does that look like? Well, it's a latitude and longitude and a couple things hanging off of it. And you have to hang more off of it because a, because you want keys and values later down, later down the road that want to be attached to that as your ontology, as opposed to you might just have a type and a name. 
So you have to have a have have to have a daughter table with the keys and values or something. But the nodes are very simple. And then what was really interesting is back when we had segments. So before ways there were segments, and a segment just linked two nodes, and that was it. And then if you had a bunch of segments that shared a name tag, then you linked them together in the user interface. This is all ancient history. But the interesting thing about segments was a, a node had a latitude and longitude and then keys and values hanging off of it. It had other things as well, but that was basically it. A segment just had two node IDs because it was from node one to node 32 or whatever. And then it had a bunch of keys and values. So the data model was actually almost the same as nodes, except the latitude and longitude on a node would be a double or a float or something, right? And the 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 data type on a segment would be the ID number. So back then a 32-bit int or something mm -hmm. for, for the two two IDs. But other than that, the code was completely reusable, right? So you could you could get both out of almost the same model. And then later on, uh, we blew that up and had ways. So it was a list of nodes, an ordered list of nodes, as opposed to just two of them. Um, yeah, I don't remember why I was telling you this, but I don't know. The data model was very simple, very, yeah, very simple. The, the, the point I was trying to get across is like how, how is like OSM different? Like, let's just stick on climate change because we went about that. But there, there are a lot of really big problems in, in the world. And the way I understand it is for you, just OSM had a simple solution in a oh, way. Oh, I like see. That was, so easier for like an individual to tackle and climate change you can't get there like that uh it's still a, actually a question actually sure so that i think the reason that technology is good the reason that we made lots of money in technology the reason that there's innovation in technology is because it's legal right it's not that there's something inherently magical about computers or inherently magical about software, although you could say like intellectual property revenues are much better than physical revenues because IP, I can get 70% margins, right? But if I sell a hotel room, I'm making 2% or something, right? But it's legal, right? If I want to make a hotel, that's essentially illegal, right? If you want to build a building, that's essentially illegal. Anyone who's tried to build a building will tell you it's basically illegal to build a building, right? For a lot of complicated reasons. Right. And people still do build buildings, but it's exceptionally difficult. And not because it's hard to source bricks, right? It's difficult primarily because of um, government intervention. And some of that government intervention is good, right? I don't want a building to burn down, right? And some of it's bad. Uh, you know, I you can only build a building that is this high or has this many rooms. It's completely common in the Western world, right? To the point where to a first approximation, building a building is illegal. Making a toothbrush is illegal. Toothbrushes are regulated everywhere in the Western world. If you make a toothbrush and you try to sell it, that's illegal. You can go to prison for that, right? It really is that bad. But if you make a website, sky's the limit, hands off, do what you want, right? Um, if you wanna make an app, go crazy, right? That's less true over time. The GDPR put, you know, put a massive break on some of it. Um, amongst other things. Don't, don't get me wrong. The GDPR, GDPR is good for some things, very bad for other things, I'm sure. Um, but yes, I, the thing with OSM is that it was possible, right? If your starting point is, well, I need to change the education system so that everyone doing a GIS degree thinks differently, right? That's obviously going to be very, very difficult. But if I can just put up a website, find like-minded people, and we go build a thing, um, then that's very tractable. Now, if you wanted to solve climate change, so let, let's assume that the solution to climate change is removing CO2. That's not the only solution. There are many other solutions you could put. You know, people have talked about putting a giant mirror in the sky. Um, Neil Stevenson wrote a book about putting tons of sulfur in the atmosphere, which basically stimulate a volcano to lower the, lower the temperature. Um, most people don't know that the, the most influential gas for climate change is water, mm -hmm. right? Maybe somehow you could... Re reduce the amount of water in the atmosphere. There's all these different solutions, right? It's not just electric cars, right? Electric cars are great for some things, right? But it's not just, it's not that simple, right? Uh, but if you wanted to go and do one of those solutions, it's probably illegal. In fact, Neil Simonson alludes to that in his book. Um, these people go and try and make 
things that dump tons of sulfur into the atmosphere. And the first thing that the government does tries to do is kill it, right? And then other governments try and put their own sulfur into the atmosphere, mm. amongst other things that happen in, in that wonderful book. Um, you have to break the law to, to do this stuff, which is very painful. Like Uber, what did Uber do? The first thing they did, break the law, right? Um, which is a risk, a big, big risk that most people aren't willing to take for very good reasons, right? So the the innovation has to happen in in some free zone, right? And that's exactly what we do, right? So when when the rule when the rule of law and all of the rules become so constraining that you can no longer do anything, what governments tend to do is they'll go and make a, a zone where the laws don't apply anymore. Right. So the Docklands in England was was such a zone where they said, look. The Docklands is a disaster back in the 80s, right? There's nothing there. It's a poor area of London. Um, no one's going to build anything there, not necessarily just because there's no economic return, but also because it's basically illegal. So we're going to relax all the constraints. We're going to let you build what you want. And you end up with these ginormous buildings. And eventually, you know, the the Docklands is an incredible area of London that people want to live and work in. Eventually, it wasn't in the beginning. But they did that by ripping the Band-Aid off and just saying... Here's a special place where we're going to have no more rules, right? And free trade zones are exactly the same. And it's kind of, I'm waving my hands a little bit, but it's what Singapore and Hong Kong were, right? That's what I was thinking. In you know, 1945, Singapore and Hong Kong were approximately swamps, right? That's also a bit pejorative. It's not meant to be. It's just like, you know, it was like any other terrible post-war place. And uh, they ripped the Band-Aid off, right? The British in Hong Kong, Lee Kuan Yew in, in Singapore. And then 70 years later, you have these incredible thriving cities, right? Just by having less rules, mm -hmm. right? So I think very deeply that technology, the reason that it's interesting, the reason that it's big, the reason that people like me spend time in it is not because there's some inherent magic in computers. It's because there's no rules. Got if it. I want to build a plane, illegal. I want to build a building, illegal. I want to make a toothbrush, illegal. But you can make a mapping website, right? It's pretty much that simple. And that's why Mars is so interesting, by the way. It's because none of these rules are, exist on Mars. Mm -hmm. If you go to Mars, I bet if you're on like one of those first 20 flights, maybe those first 200 flights, maybe even one of the first 2,000 flights to Mars, right? You get to Mars, you can do whatever you want. There's no big power structure stopping you, right? And that doesn't mean that they're going to go to Mars and make toothbrushes and buildings, <laughs> right? Again, that would be broken thinking. But they, they're going to go do interesting stuff where they're free to. Right, and the first products that we get from Earth get at Earth from Mars are going to be intellectual property because it's going to be expensive and slow to ship something. Right, if you order something from Mars, it's going to take two years, give or take. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, they have to ship intellectual property, and it will be legal to go do things with IP over there. And if you think there's lots of restrictions on IP too, here, like there's many good things in IP, sure, yeah. but copyrights, patents, trademarks. Um, you know, most of the world doesn't have free speech, right? We we might hope that Mars has free speech, you know. So there'll be all, all sorts of interesting things just because there's no rules, right? Which is a really hard problem because, you know, some rules are pretty nice. The fact that you go to prison if you kill someone is creates a pretty big incentive not to do that. Like, the, I feel like it's a very hard problem. Like, where do you put the limit? on what do you allow and, and what don't you allow. Like when you were talking about the height of the buildings, the first thing that comes to mind, and this is the French in me is like, yeah, in Paris, that's a big thing because they want to keep the look of the city, for example. And that's what they've decided to prioritize. Like we don't want a huge skyscraper. The only tall thing allowed is the Eiffel Tower. And if you want to big a, like build a tall building, there's like one area where you can do that. And there's like, there's reasons for that. but finding that balance feels like incredibly hard about like what what do you want to allow and what not i think at one level it's actually extremely simple so okay i mean it's interesting that you pick france because napoleonic law right as i understand it basically says everything's illegal <laughs> so that, that's a good starting point right and that's explicitly made legal right and that's where most things end up let's just make everything illegal and then we'll selectively let stuff through by permit or special pieces of paper that you can go do something. But the question is not really what is good or bad, right? Mm -hmm. The question is, which is the least bad, yeah. right? So when you get on a plane today in 2022, if you turn left, you're paying with a bunch of money, 
right? If you turn right, you're paying with a bunch of emotional discomfort, right? You either pay with money to have space or you pay with your inability to do anything because when you're at the back of the plane, you can't even open a laptop anymore, right? It's, the space is so small. You can't think about the best thing you can do at the back of the plane is watch a movie, right? So you're paying with your lack of freedoms, both physical and mental. At the front, you can do all those things. At the front of the plane, you can open a laptop, you can uh, write a book, right? You can do whatever you want, but you're paying with your money. But you pay either way, right? And it might not be an option for you, right? Because if you don't have enough money, it's not an option. But you have to recognize that there's a trade-off, right? It's not, it's not that business class is good or that economy is bad or economy is good and business class is bad. It's like, which trade-off do you want, right? So yes, let's, let's, I don't know the intricacies of planning permission in Paris, but let's assume that it's basically correct, like London, that you're not allowed to build buildings in a lot of places because in London, you would obscure the view of St. Paul's Cathedral, for example, right? That's fine, but then you deal with a bunch of downsides. And what are the downsides? Well, in the case of London, you know, a whole ton of economic value moved to the Docklands, right? Where it was legal to build things, right? In in the case of a lot of these countries, the trade-off you pay is your GDP per capita is like half of the United States, right? So it's like, great, if you want all of these restrictions, that's fine, but you're gonna be poorer, right? Whenever you put a rule in place, like if you imagine the economy is a vast network of people where money is going one way and goods or services is going the other way, right? When you put rules in place, what you're basically doing is you're taking a machete and you're cutting lots of those links, right? And when you cut those links, it means that less transactions happen. It means the size of your economy goes down. It means the velocity of money goes down. Um, and all of these things are important for, these aren't, aren't just numbers in a spreadsheet, right? They're where goods and services come from. They're, you know, the reason we're not just planting turnips all day is we have goods and services and an economy and stuff, right? Um, so they, although there's economic abstractions for these things, the reason we have this microphone or this glass or this water is because there's a bunch of economic transactions, right? You paid for this microphone, the, mic, the, the money went one way, the microphone went another, right? And you can see this most clearly maybe in COVID when different governments made a bunch of arbitrary decisions. They're like, some governments said, okay, you can buy potatoes, but you can't buy books, right? They just sort of semi-arbitrarily decided what we're going to cut. Some of it makes sense, some of it doesn't, right? But you don't, you're, you're impacting people in ways that you can't see or predict what's going to happen. Like if I'm stuck at home for two years, maybe I want to buy some books and read the books, right? It also means you're helping kill the book industry and helping the Kindle industry, right? Mm -hmm. You have all of these yeah. first, second, third order effects that you can't really see what you're doing. Huh. There's one other aspect that I wanted to come at, like we're taking a bit of a tangent here, is one of the things I found really interesting looking into OSM is that you, um, I don't know if it was you personally or like, but there was a decision to like start making a, a business around it as well. Yeah. Um, which in, we were talking about dichotomies and, and like simple separation that feels like sometimes when people are in open source, like making any money is seen as evil and terrible and things like that. Like, can you help me understand a little bit? Like what was the, um, the ideas back then? Like, why did you go in that direction? I'm very curious to understand about that. So starting, so I started a company called uh, CloudMade with a guy called Nick Black and before then, there was another company with some other people. These things evolve, right? Got it. Um, and the basic idea was to provide services around OpenStreetMap the same way that Red Hat, which was a big thing back a thousand years ago, <laughs> made uh, services around Linux. Mm -hmm. So it used to be that you could download Linux off the internet and then, you know, good luck. <laughs> you know, if you have a computer science degree or something, you're fine. But if you're United Airlines or something, you're going to need some help. And so the idea behind Red Hat was, could we take this open source software and provide it, provide a low cost, cost alternative to primarily Windows to large enterprises? So like, let's say you're United Airlines and you have to buy, I don't know, 
3 million computers, something like that. And Windows licenses for them, support for them, and then software on top of them. And then, by the way, when you when you buy that many computers, many of them are going to fail. All kinds of things are going to go wrong. So you have to have a bunch of people help you with all of that. That's less and less true today, right? So the idea was, um, instead of buying those Windows licenses, could we buy, could we get Linux for free and then pay less for just the, the service and support? And that was the business model. And it turned out that it was approximately good. So it largely worked, right? And the, it, it eventually Red Hat was bought by IBM and now it's ancient history. Okay. But the idea was, could you do the same thing with Maps? And the answer is yes. I mean, that's what Mapbox does, right? Um, but back then it was a, a semi-crazy idea and uh, difficult to execute and difficult to prove. Um, and for me personally, it was very difficult on a number of levels, but one of them was in the open source community, I was the evil capitalist, <laughs> crazy person, right? Um, but to the, I don't know, the the business world, for want of a better term, I was the flaky, hippie, open source guy, right? Neither of which is true, um, but it made it difficult to operate in both. Mm-hmm. And it made it difficult to sort of bridge the gap. But I feel like that was important still to, to, to go down, like being in that uncomfortable, like in between the two, like, cause there's a lot of great open source stuff, but it, if you don't have a computer degree, like you can't computer science degree, you can't really do much about it. Like th- that business aspect is, is pretty tricky. Like, did you, did you see that? Like, this is what we're going to need to, to make it to, to keep the project going. Or was it like, well, this is great, but like at some point I need to put foot on the table as well. To me, it was just an obvious extension and an obvious thing to do that once you have an open source project, there are going to be people that need their hands held. And you can hold their hand in a number of ways. You can go to conferences and talk about it. Mm -hmm. You can put training materials on the internet. You can have a wiki. You can have mailing lists. That's one class, right? But there's another class who have more money than time, right? They're the people that when they get on the plane, they turn left. They have more money than time. And there are people who are willing to take that money (laughs) in exchange for providing goods and services, right? So... Um, there were going to be people who wanted to use OpenStreetMap but couldn't see how, or they didn't understand that OpenStreetMap was not a drop-in replacement for existing maps. It has its own pros and cons. It has its own qualities, right? Um, And so providing those services seemed like an obvious thing to do. And also interesting and exciting and start a business and learn a whole bunch of things and be uncomfortable, Mm -hmm. right? So you, you you've like let me rephrase that. What are the stuff that excites you today? Because it's still the tech aspect, like in general. For me, it's the tech aspect, just because everything's illegal, right? <laughs> I would I would love to design and build buildings. I would love to make a toothbrush. Believe it or not, there's mm-hmm. you know those are just simple examples. There's lots of things that I'd love to do. I mean, like here in Amsterdam, there's a great company called Van Moof that makes these wonderful bicycles, right? I'd love to make a bicycle. There's all these kinds of things, right? But you only have one life and you only have a certain amount of time and you have a number of demands on that time. And how do you, you know, do it? So to me, there's lots of things that are exciting. I think the most exciting thing is what I don't know. Right. And, um, you know, we're talking about diving earlier, Mm right? Right. So I've been diving a lot recently. And the reason that I dived is I was terrified of it. That was the main thing, right? It's also why I was doing my pilot's license. It's like, you know, flying scary. You're, you're in this thing made by, you know, if, you've, if you know aeronautical engineers, they're not, <laughs> you know, they're just human, it turns out, right? Um, but we've made these systems that make flying efficient and safe and so on. Um, and diving was sort of the same. It was like, I didn't really want to be in open ocean. You know, because there's sharks that are going to eat you, like, obviously, <laughs> right? Um, and also, when I started to, di- to dive, I discovered just how bad my motion sickness was, okay. right? So it took me three attempts to get my open water because I just got so sick every time. Like, so I got so sick that I was uh, just couldn't function, couldn't think, right? If you've ever been in shock, which I've ever, only ever been in shock once, but it's a little bit like that. You're just unable to, to function, but if you can push through all of these things, right? So eventually 
now I can dive fine. I'll jump, I'll jump in the ocean. It's fine. Um, and I have Dramamine, which is a, a drug to help you with motion sickness. Um, and you figure out all these things, you get to the other side and then you can learn a bunch of things. Right. And it's interesting. Diving is very much like learning to fly. Right. So I've learned to fly a plane and I've learned to fly a hang glider. And both of those things, what you do is you repeatedly train on the things that are going to fail, right? So in the case of a plane, it's the engine. The engine's going to fail in some entertaining way, right? When you're taking off or when you're landing or when you're flying and you just repeatedly practice the entertaining ways that the engine will fail because it's the main thing that can fail and it's the main thing keeping you in the air, right? And hang gliding, you repeatedly practice taking off and landing because it turns out that people mostly crash when they're close to the ground, right? <laughs> and in hang gliding, there's some really funny things like... When you do a hang glide launch, if you're doing it um, just by running, because you can also get towed, mm -hmm. um, people will forget to look at the horizon. And it tends to be that you go where you look, right? It's called target fixation. So you'll see people at hang glide launch points, there'll be a big concrete ramp and they will just run down the ramp looking down <laughs> and they'll run and people will scream at them. This is a daily thing, right? Even seasoned pilots will accidentally do this every now and again because they're not thinking or they're busy or something else is going on. And so one of the th main things you just learn repeatedly when you're doing a hang glider launch is to look out at the horizon. It's just this stupid stuff, right? And with diving, it's, it's very entertaining. It's the same. It's like, what's the main thing that can go wrong? Well, your air, right? And there's like 50 different ways your air can go wrong. The regulator, the second stage regulator can fail. The, the thing can come off. But you can literally, you know, it's just this, it's a story of checklists of people making mistakes, right? But you can jump in the water and the tank falls off. So you literally check that the tank is attached, you know, dumb stuff like that. Um, but once you go through all of this stuff, which is all very boring, well, it's not boring. It's uh, tedious, maybe. tedious, challenging, entertaining. Then you can go see turtles or whatever, right? But then there's this stuff on the other side. And now you sort of understand this other thing. Right, so seventy percent of the world is water, roughly by surface area. Right, diving, you're only ever going to see some tiny fraction of a percent because diving, you only go down to eighteen meters if you're twelve meters, eighty meters, I forget for open water, and then you can go down to forty with once you have a deep specialty after after the advanced open water. It's still a tiny fraction of the world that you can possibly explore, but you have opened up some sort of phase space, right? Um, the same could be said about flying. The same could be said, I don't know, about being an astronaut or going to Mars or something. So the thing that interests me is opening up those phase spaces and understanding these other systems and how they work. And then you can use those analogies in other things and, and figure stuff out and, you know, push through the challenges of like, hey, I'm afraid of open water to get to the point of not afraid. And then you learn all this other stuff. So I'm not sure if that answers your question very well, but there are also specific technologies that, that I'm particularly interested in, I think. Sure. Crypto is interesting. I think <laughs> AR is sort of interesting. I think I think self-driving electric cars are going to reshape a lot, a lot more than people think. You know the world. Um, let's go on to crypto. Crypto. Let's do it. What what's what's exciting about crypto? So for me, the interesting thing about crypto is um, before cryptocurrencies there was a lot of interest in open source cryptography. So there's a lot of ancient history here, right? There's thing, this thing called PGP and then GPG that cryptography used to be the realm of the security services and that was it, right? And then uh, there was crypto built into uh, PKZip. This is, I think it was PKZip and it was terrible, but it meant that consumers could have some cryptography, right? Okay. And then, then we got PGP, pretty good privacy, and then GPG, which is an open source version of that, just for encrypting emails and documents, right? And there's all this history because all of those open source crypto people, which Neil Stevenson writes about in a book called Cryptonomicon, um, they also wanted to figure out how to do uh, trust networks. So there's these things called faux friend of a friend networks. This is all pre-Facebook. Okay. How can we have decentralized trust networks, right? then how can we have uh, decentralized money? And so there were all these systems um, based on wacky technologies, like uh, because what they were trying to do was make an analog to paper money. And with paper money, I don't know how much money's in your pocket. You don't know how much money's in my pocket. That's called the ledger, 
right? Yeah. And so all of those systems, I don't want to say all, many of those systems were trying to get around the problem. The main problem was called the double spend problem that if you had some digital money and you spent it twice, how would we know, right? And it's a very hard problem. Someone has to keep track. Well, that that's one solution. That's the Bitcoin solution, right? But in theory, you could make systems with, with no centralized uh, ledger, right? But it was very difficult, and it's what a lot of people were focused on. How could we make cash that, uh, digital cash that people could spend without a centralized registry, without centralized control of the money like a bank, right? But still not allow people to spend the money twice, which is a hard problem. And there's a bunch of technical solutions to that that are sort of interesting. The other major problem was, uh, at least at the time, was micropayments. People thought that micropayments were impossible because when the, the transaction size, the amount of money I'm paying, starts to get on the order of magnitude of the transaction cost, it gets difficult, right? So if, if I want to send you $1,000 with a credit card, right, it's going to cost me 3%, right? But if I want to send you $3, <laughs> it's going to cost me $3. So it's, it's yeah. give or take, right? So it's going to cost, the smaller the transaction, the higher the fraction of the transaction cost is. But there's lots of things you want to do microtransactions for, right? Like I want to buy a coffee, I want to buy a 99 cent app, right? Those kinds of things. Um, and so people were attacking them from different ways. Then there were papers saying that this stuff was, you know, impossible for various reasons. And then the the reason that crypto was interesting way back in, let's say, 2011 or something, was that it solved those problems quite elegantly by relaxing the constraint by just saying, okay, we're not we're we're not going to try and have a complete freedom in the transactions. We're going to have a central ledger, right? And then uh, the blockchain is an elegant way of, uh, uh, and proof of work is an elegant way of the creation of new money, because that was another problem. How do we create new money, right? Do we just distribute it at random? Do we, you know, what? Um, and Bitcoin sort of fairly elegantly solved all of those problems or perceived problems with a very nice technical solution. And it had forerunners, you know, there's hash cash and other stuff, but mm -hmm. that was the interesting thing back then. Right. The interesting thing now is more like what Balaji Srinivasan would say, or um, Naval Ravikant, or something. They, you know, talk about immutable money. Having a record that is Im immutable is a deep plea, is a big thing, right? Like one of the things I saw on, on Twitter the other day was people talking about putting scientific papers on the blockchain, right? Because so I could have, let's say, a, a, a statistical paper of medical results or something. I could put. It would be expensive today, but I could put all of my my data on the blockchain. I could put the statistical functions in there as well, right? And I could put it all on the chain and it's going to be there forever, provably, right? That I put it on there and that anyone can interrogate the data, which is a step change in things, right? Because one of the points those guys would sort of make is that historically we've been able to change the past whenever it can, like suited us. Right, so the, the famous example is some Stalin-esque thing where there's a general standing next to him and then he gets airbrushed out of the photo, right? With the blockchain, that stuff becomes impossible because it's all immutable, right? You can go back and you can see, well, it was there, right? Steve said that next year there will be electric cars, yes or no, right? You're going to be able to see that stuff. Um, so for me, it goes way beyond just uh, units of currency like Bitcoin. The interesting things become all these downstream effects. How do we put maps on the blockchain? Right? Today, we have a lot of centralized systems. OpenStreetMap is a centralized system. How do we blow that up and put all the data so it's distributed? Right? One way is blockchain-ish things. So if I understand correctly, is seeing like right now, you have to trust the centralized OpenStreetMap server to go back to the history. Like what was the map like 2010, for example? But there's nothing preventing whoever has access to that server to be like, those nodes weren't there, they were here. Um, and that becomes the truth, basically. And so if we put that on uh, blockchain decentralized, that we keep a record of that and we can't change that. Did, does that like encapsulate the, the idea? It's one of the things that it solves. Got it. Right. Now, you might not care what the map looked like in 2010, but you might care that you know a government scientist said that covid is x but it turns out it's actually y 
right? So there's a debate right now, where did COVID come from? It's actually a debate that most people don't want to have anymore, right? We want to pretend it all just didn't happen. And there's a diff- number of different points of view, right? And it's very convenient for a lot of people to be able to say, well, I said X when they actually said Y, mm-hmm. right? So having an immutable record of things is very useful, right? We, we're not really subject to this problem in Western democracies to some degree, right? Because we, we have relatively open records of the past, but it's very convenient for some governments in the world to have root access to what we said about things, mm-hmm. right? And also to be able to change the money. Like there's countries all over the world all the time that just go into the bank and just set everyone to zero, you know, which is sort of inconvenient for a lot of people, right? <laughs> you know, so it, an immutable record has all of these interesting facts, including in science and data and the news and so on, that we're, we're not really going to figure out for a while, that's going to change a lot of things, not just for us, but for other countries, right? Um, but there's also, it solves a lot of other problems. Like one of the problems with OSM is, and it's not unique to OSM, one of the problems with Wikipedia, it's the same, centralized entities. It means that we squabble over things like who's running the entity? What does the data model look like, right? Um, what should the what should the Wikimedia Foundation focus on? What should the OpenStreetMap Foundation focus on? And there's a bunch of stuff that people do. And it means that you have to have a, under our current legal frameworks, you have to have a central entity that owns the IP. Someone has to own the OpenStreetMap.org domain name. Someone has to own the copyright, that kind of thing, trademarks. Um, so the idea is, if you could blow that up, and if it was decentralized, what would that look like, right? And so you have things that look a little bit NFT-ish or a little bit, uh, decentralized where instead of one organization having an enormous amount of money, having all the servers, having to hire someone to run them, one of the things that you do when you decentralize is that you spread the cost, right? And the cost is not just the cost. It's also the power structure. It's yeah. also who's involved. It's also who's writing the software. Right? So earlier you mentioned that like a, a camel is a committee based course. Right. How do you prevent that from happening as well? Like it feels like, you know, we were talking earlier about like the, the data model of OSM and it feels like having someone who has a vision and says like, this is where we're, gonna, we're going, even if right now it doesn't make sense is really important as well. That someone is like, I'm gonna the, bear the cost basically if it, if it doesn't work out. Right. But I really deeply think this is the direction we should be going in. Right. How do you think we, we prevent that like committee based creation of everything well i think you have to blow things up so like the, i would I first of all give two analogies so people think that wikipedia killed britannica right but they forget about encarta right so it used to be that there were salespeople that would go to every house in countries and try and sell you big sets of encyclopedias and you'd be put on a payment plan for this and you would get you'd get suckered into it primarily because you wanted your kid to learn so you buy them this encyclopedia that nobody ever read, right? But it was there if you needed it once a year to look up, you know, the atomic weight of chrome or something. But it was there. Then what happened was that uh, Encarta blew it up. And Encarta blew it up by making it a $49.99 or $99 CD in 1995, right? By saying, we're not going to be as good as Britannica. In fact, we're going to be knowingly worse, right? I think the first version of Encarta they bought bought it from some cheap encyclopedia. So the the first versions were knowingly worse, but we are vastly cheaper and we have all these additional benefits. Like you can search and we have videos and pictures and and we can update it. And then Wikipedia came along and blew that up, right? So what happens, this is a paradigm structure scientific revolutions thing that the paradigm changes and things get blown up, right? The, The image that I like is if you've ever seen molten lava underwater, so a volcano going off underwater, this molten lava goes down and then the outer layer freezes, right? It turns into stone and then it sits there for a second, two seconds, three seconds. And then the lava keeps going and it breaks and fractures, right? So you get these these sort of uh, periods of stasis and then these periods of fractures, right? Like going from in, uh, Britannica to Encarta to Wikipedia. So with OSM, in many ways, we're in a period of stasis, right? And we have been for a while. So the API looks the same. The API is still XML, right? The API looks the same, data model looks the same, even the website looks the same. And the reason you get this stasis is because there's no leadership, right? That's one big part of it. 
it's also there's some technical reasons that um, historically at least the, the the people doing the system administration in OSM are the same people writing the software. And that's not quite true, Got it. right? But it's approximately true. And you have diametrically opposed constraints then because if you're writing a piece of software, you want the system, ad, the sysadmins to keep everything stable. They want to have to keep it up like five nines reliability, site reliability, right? Um, you, you're serving lots of people. You get people shout at you if the website goes down, right? But a developer by necessity sort of has to break things all the time. Because if you're building something, you're going to change things. And when you put the same people in charge of both things, which again, is not quite true, but it's approximately true, it leads to stasis. So a lot of things that OpenStreetMap should have done over the last decade-ish, right? Like building their own mobile client would be something. Open, why isn't there an OpenStreetMap client? It's just an example, right? Mm -hmm. Or why don't we go to JSON instead of XML, right? Simple things like that. Or, you know, my personal favorite that I've been complaining about for a long time is OSM shows the best version of the map. When you look at OSM, it looks good, right? On purpose. Okay. But there's a lot of missing data, like there's a lot of addresses missing, right? And this is less and less true over time. But personally, I think if OSM showed the worst view of the map, then it would rapidly improve. So in the beginning, OSM was blank, mm. which is the worst view of the map. And there's a, there's a reason to fix everything. So you could have OSM where it only showed roads that someone had tagged, yes, all of the addresses are here. Or this road does not have addresses, I've checked, right? So you could have that tag. And then in the renderer, you could only show roads that are good, or you could show everything else grayed out or something, right? You could show some bad version of the map, right? And that would spur an enormous amount of effort to go fix everything so that the map looked good again, right? So there were these simple things that you could do if you were a, a benevolent dictator, let's say, that would go and achieve that. But OSM doesn't achieve anything anymore like that because it's essentially committee-based and committees never do anything, mm. right? So um, the question and the reason I was talking about Britannica and Wikipedia and so on is like, is this an improvable situation? I don't know, maybe, right? Versus what is the next thing, right? That will make OSM irrelevant, let's say, right? And it probably, it's not gonna be tomorrow and it's not gonna be a negative, right? But the next thing that's going to blow up OSM is going to be one of two things. It's going to be automation, right? So we talked about earlier, Tesla could just make a map in a day with the right software and they could make a great map. And by the way, that's really interesting because OSM, we have this, OSM, you can think of this vast complicated network, right? This artifact that we're trying to keep perfect all the time. But instead, if you think of just, we're going to make a map every day and then tomorrow we'll make another map and then tomorrow we'll make another map after that, right? And you're just throwing it away every time. And the software every day is just collecting all the data signals and turning it into a map. You completely get around all the, pro the modern problems of map making, which is that you're, you have this artifact that you're trying to keep perfect, like spinning a plate on a stick, right? You've got all these plates on sticks that you're trying to keep spinning. And if you, if you don't keep them all spinning, one of them's gonna crash and fall over, maybe it'll knock the other plate over. That's what it's like trying to maintain a map, not just OSM, in a lot of commercial systems as well, right? Um, so the two things that are gonna blow it up are automation, or some sort of distributed blockchain-ish like system for this map data, such that it's not centralized. But that's still sort of predicated upon the idea that um, you're gonna have a bunch of volunteers going around making this data or something. Um, or it could look like something like um, Daylight, right? So Facebook slash Meta's distribution of OSM where they take OSM, clean it up, maybe add some data, and then they have a known distribution, a bit like a Linux distribution of okay. Ubuntu, right? Where no longer are you using OSM, like nobody downloads the Linux kernel, right? I mean, some people do, but most people don't download the Linux kernel. You just, it's running on your phone, on your Android device. It's, it's, it's part of Ubuntu, right? But you're paying for some downstream service, right? So you could imagine a world where you take OSM, fix it, um, for some value of fix, add to things that OSM misses, which is for some use cases, a vast amount of stuff. And then uh, you ship that as a product, which is exactly what Facebook did, right? And it's what Microsoft would have called in the 90s, embrace, extend and extinguish, right? Um, so to me, the interesting things like you could put 
an enormous amount of effort into trying to fix OSM's problems or do this stuff. And it is possible and people should do that. And I'm happy to help, right, where I can. But it's a lot of up work, uphill work trying to convince a committee of something that's obvious that no one wants to do because they only bear the downside, right? It's not inherent in committees or, or, or those people. It's like, it's the incentives, right? If you work at BMW, you're going to make gasoline cars. It's just how it works, right? Um, convincing you to go and make electric cars is going to be exceptionally difficult. And when you make electric cars, they're going to look retarded like the i3 or the i8 or whatever. And, you know, even, even the latest BMW electric cars, they have to put some stupid big blue stripe down the side of it, like to say, it's an electric car, right? You can go and try and convince BMW to make electric cars, or you can start Tesla or something, or you could go work at Tesla, right? Which one is easier? <laughs> Which one are you going to be fighting less? Right. Which one are you going to make more progress? Well, that's pretty simple. Right. And then the automation piece is super interesting. How do you just automatically make maps? And that doesn't mean that humans aren't going to make maps. It doesn't mean that OpenStreetMap will cease to exist. Botanica still exists, believe it or not. It's like, um, but it's these, these new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Right. And those two things don't seem to be mutually exclusive either like the automation and the decentralized blockchain aspect that you were mentioning, like you could have both. You could absolutely have both. Um, but it's, it's, they're just different ways of thinking about the same problem and they have different cadences. So, I mean, this, uh, Neil Stevenson also read a book called Diamond Age and there, there was a big, there's a tension in the book between, in the book, what's called the feed and the seed, right? So there's people who want to make, in this book, there's a science fiction future where people make things out of atoms. And we have machines that make things out of atoms, individual atoms. And there's sort of two ways of doing that. There's the Western way in this book, where there's a big pipe that comes to your house that ships you atoms in a vacuum on demand, right? Which is a little bit like our modern water networks or our... Uh -huh gas networks or our internet. There's a line of fiber that comes to your house, right? And then uh, in the East, in, in the sort of China analogy, there's these things called seeds and you can make a seed and then the seed will make other seeds, right? So like I, I plant a plant, it gets pollinated and I can get more, some more seeds out of this, right? And then I can give those seeds to you. So it's decentralized. Right, and it's bottom up, and there's it's part of the book that there's this tension between these these two philosophies of thinking about things. Um, so, yes, you could imagine a future that was both automated and on the blockchain for creating large map large data sets. And this isn't exclusive to OpenStreetMap. You could put Wikipedia on the blockchain if you wanted to, right? Um, but it's it's it, there's a tension between those ways of thinking because they lead to different outcomes, right? If I'm Tesla and I'm automatically making my map every day. Why on earth would I put it on the blockchain, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to cost me a bunch of money, not a lot of upside. I give all my competitors access to my data to, you know, depending on the intellectual property uh, protections that you're going to put on it. Um, and on the other hand, if you're making a map by humans, right, um, why would I automate it? <laughs> right? Because fundamentally, OSM is a human project. It's the people that make it work, Right. So it's people not that those people, ideas. yeah. So it's not that those people are bad or that they're dumb for editing an OSM at all. It's it's fantastic. It's about shaping the direction it goes, right? And it's about trying to claim whether the project is complete or not. Like that's a big thing for me. OSM should be done by now, right? But the reason it isn't is principally, but not limited to addresses. That's a big one. And there are other things and they're completely solvable problems, but they're not solvable in the context of command and control and committees, right? That's why you have people fiddling around with a data model or, you know, trying to map trees in zoos or something because they're not connected to the problem, right? If I give, if you give OSM to your grandmother or something, the first thing they want to do is search and OSM is not particularly searchable. Right? because it misses addresses. People use addresses as their form of communication. It's like a staple. And OSM is not particularly addressable. And again, it's less and less true. It's getting better and better. Um, but that should be a solved problem. And the reason it's not is the community is not shaped in that way. Got right? Um, but that doesn't mean it's bad. You still, it's 
these things can both exist, right? Tesla can go make an automated map. And once they've made that map, it will give permission to a lot of other people to make maps. Right? We, we live in this permission culture where you're not allowed to do something unless someone else has done it, especially in, in Europe, right? So once Tesla's done it, you'll find a whole bunch of people will go and make their own automated map. Um, that can exist because the focus is going to be on vehicles for a start, right? But then it can also exist that humans make a map. But they they open up all kinds of possibilities because if you can automate automatically make a map, then it means that there isn't just one like OSM is just one map, right? And then you take it and filter it. But you could live in a world where, let's say, you take OSM for the whole world, and then you use tracks for Africa and Africa, right? Automatically, or you can automatically make a map of the West, take OSM in any middle tier country. And then in China, you take the official Chinese government data because you have to, because it's the law, right? Yeah. And you can automate all of that. And that doesn't just automate the data, it automates the licensing, right? So you can mix and match the licensing, or you could take all of, you could make a completely automated map um, just by using GPS traces, right? And then you could say, I'm gonna take land use land cover from Landsat or some Airbus satellite or something. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna take road names from OSM, but I'm gonna mix and match all of this stuff and you could just press a button and make a map that works for you. And you can do this on a per geography basis, right? So, you know, Western Europe, I'm gonna do X, you know, Russia, I'm gonna do Y, China, I'll do that. And then my map can be different to yours, right? Cause that's another big thing is that the maps of today are all the same, right? I use the same map you do, right? But that doesn't really make any sense, right? Going forward, because if you don't own a car, why are you showing me freeways, right? If I'm just gonna bike in Amsterdam, I really don't care about a lot of things that are on that map, mm -hmm. including but not limited to know, right? The names of the roads, right? The train lines, the the autobahns. I don't care about any of that if I'm cycling in Amsterdam, that oh. kind of thing. Um, Is that like the F thirty five of maps? Yeah, yeah, right. It becomes it becomes use case specific, right? Or like another another one that I really like is if you own a if you own a boat in Amsterdam, quite a few people own boats, mm -hmm. then you're you're navigating the negative map. Right, you're navigating the negative space that's on a traditional map, right? So when you're, if you invert it and you wanted to make a map for canals, it would look completely different. Like there's no, nothing stopping us having routing over canals in Amsterdam, which is something that people do every single day, right? But they mostly do it by memory and looking around. And what do I care about if I'm on my canal boat or my little barge and you know we're all drinking on Konigsdag or whatever, right? I what we want to do is we want fun things to see. We want to see where all the other boats are. Um, there's part of the university here, right, has that big mirror on the underside of it. So you, you go on the canal and then the underside of the building, which is above you, is all a big mirror. So there's these sites that have nothing to do with biking or driving. So the map would look completely different. But we don't have any of that today, principally because we still are constrained by the idea that we all, all use the same map and the same data or that it's outside of our control because the costs of shipping a map are high or whatever. And all of that will eventually go away. Because like, is that part of like, going back to what we were seeing, you know, at the beginning about like making maps for machines and so we can make them differently. Like basically we, we don't have to try to make everything fit into like how a, a person sees it. Like you right. could have something, but you just query it differently every time for every use case. Right. That's exactly it. And, but you get trapped in a business model or a way of thinking or whatever. Like I could imagine, here's something that anyone could do is make an app for pedestrian or bike navigation in Amsterdam. And it would be super useful, right? Nobody uses an app for walking around Amsterdam. No one uses an app for biking to the to first approximation, right? Everyone has to use Google or whatever, right? Or Apple. And all of those maps are geared to the main use case, which is driving. But the main use case, if you're a resident of Amsterdam, is not driving, mm -hmm. right? And there's all kinds of wacky stuff that you can experience if you bike around Amsterdam, right? There's roads which are officially bike paths, but aren't. Cars go the wrong way down them all the time. Or uh, there's ways of route routing. Like there's a, there's a famous thing in San Francisco called the Wiggle, which is this sort of zigzag between two hills. So you don't, if you're a cyclist, you don't want to go up hills, at least traditionally, you know, pre-electric bikes. You don't want to go up a hill and just go down again if you could just go around it. That's like a hundred times more efficient. Um, and there are maps that show this thing called the wiggle, but they're not, 
central to cyclists' lives for a number of reasons, right? If you're a cyclist, you don't want to be distracted because you're worried about getting run over by a car. You want something simple that says where you go. There's all these things to, to fix. Um, and these are just sort of naive speculations. But there's all types of maps that could go beyond just, you know, copy and Google, right? <laughs> If I were to push back on that, I would say like, I'm sure there are apps that allow you to cycle better in any given city, but you probably never heard about them. And Google Maps is like, it, it's backed, I think, to your point about like showing the better version of OSM. It's bad, but it's not bad enough that I'm gonna go out of my way to change it. Sure. I feel like there's that. That happens all the time. I mean, yeah. you, you have this camera that keeps shutting itself off. <laughs> Right, and you put up with that, at least in the short term, for a variety of reasons. Right, um, so yeah, we deal with we we deal with bad technology all the time, but it used to be. I mean, like I've been recently, I've been reading Dyson's book, like Dyson vacuum cleaner, Dyson, not physicist Dyson, and um, one of the things he talks about is just how terrible cars used to be, that it would break down all the time. Right, and for us, that is no longer a problem. If your car breaks down, there's something deeply wrong. Right, um, even even gasoline cars. I mean, right? It's it's unheard of and insane. Why would your car break down? Because we solved that problem, right? Um, and I think that applies to all things, right? Like your camera's breaking down. In the future, why would you even look at it? It will just it will never break down, right? This, this is how we solve problems. It's like a history is this vast filter of like filtering out all the problems so we have things that work. So yeah, today the map you're using is suboptimal, but it's fine. And that's fine, right? But it's under a current model. Like, why does everyone use that mo that right, map right, that's right, fine? Right, right, right. Because it's enormously expensive to make a map and serve it, right? Yeah. But all of that will go away. You know, there's clever ways of doing this stuff. Yeah. Like, a lot of people pay for data, right, for for pulling a map onto your phone. But there's hacks around this. Like, the, the, I, the I, iOS maximum app payload, I think, is a gigabyte or something. But most people will make a small app and then they'll stream the data, right? But if you if you just loaded up all the data in the app, then Apple is paying to do the data distribution for you, right? So there are ways around all of this stuff that will get easier over time. I see. I still wanted to get back to like the, the that original question about like leadership in a distributed system. Like, I, I want to get back on that. Like, do you think there's a way to solve that? Like, you have a distributed system, like, and we're talking blockchain, but I think it can be anything else. How do you still have leadership in that sort of system? Well, the, uh, well there's two, two basic types of leadership, right? There's, there's the 48 Laws of Power Leadership. If you ever heard of that book, no, I uh, it's a slightly controversial book, but there's the the political way to power, which is what the 42 laws of power is sort of about. 48 laws of power. Um, how do I become the person that's in charge? How do I manage decisions? You preach change, but you don't really change anything. You talk about how bad your opponents are. Mm. That's the traditional path that most people are familiar with of how leadership looks to some degree, right? Then there's the the uh, disruptive path, which you might say is the, I don't know, Steve Jobs path or something, right? Where you just go and somehow magically raise enormous amounts of money and go do this thing, which later people figure out is what they wanted. Or to your point, Ford made the Model T and famously claimed, I think, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not, but that- it Makes a good story. It makes a good story that uh, if you ask people what they want, they would have said a faster horse, right? There's the two traditional ones. What's interesting in crypto, and I'm not saying it's good, mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's bad, I'm not saying it's going to work, but what's interesting um, is the idea of essentially an anonymous voting, right? Okay. That you have protocols um, like this. There's decentralized exchanges, for example. So there's no single exchange for crypto products where everything just happens on the blockchain as a smart contract. And then changes to that contract operate basically by voting on people people who own tokens vote on it mm -hmm. right and what's interesting and useful is it's it's distributed it's anonymous but someone has to still go and do the work right so you can sort of skip some of the problems but not all of them because ultimately those projects can go sour if the leadership fails for 
500 reasons. Um, if uh, no one feels like doing the work or if those tokens are no longer valuable, then there's no you know, real world money, as we call it today, to go, to go implement the change that someone wants. Um, but I think the basic, I mean, it, I think it becomes a personal preference, right? There are people who want to be politicians, right? And then there are people who just want to blow everything up. Right. Not in the sense of watching the world burn. Right. Yeah. But in the sense of going and doing the next thing. In the Steve Jobs way. To some degree. Yeah. Like you look around at all the mobile phones and you're like, <laughs> surely we could do something better. Right. Right. Or, you know, electric cars are another analogy. But we can typically people can only see these analogies and examples in retrospect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You can talk about being BMW or VW or something and trying to make electric cars and it's obvious to everyone, but they often can't see it in their own context. You know, if you're running a mapping company and you've got 5,000 people making a map and you say, well, I could replace all these people with a spreadsheet. There's a lot of inherent like downside to that. I have revenue customers, yeah. I have a business model. There's a lot of things that tie you in the day to day that if you were to look right. at the what you did a year ago to go back to the Nassim Taleb newspaper, you'd be like, there's like, there was no impact right. on that thing at the moment. It felt like a lot and we were tied into it, but right. it didn't really change much. Right. And the same thing with OSM. If you went, if you go to an OSM conference and just got up and you know, your talk is going to be, Hey, I'm going to replace all of you with a blockchain or <laughs> Hey, I'm going to replace all of you with a spreadsheet or something. It's also not going to go down well, yeah. but I th we can all see that that's kind of the future or that yeah. the, at least these, I mean, automation is definitely the future, but I don't know about blockchain. It's at least it's interesting, yeah, right? Yeah. It's worth um, taking a look at. And it, it's just hilarious to me, especially years ago, that the same some of the same people, so there were people that said, it, said OSM would never work, yada, 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 mm -hmm. it's insanity. But then there were other people who could see it, right? And we're like, OSM's great, obviously it will work. This is great, the old way of doing things is bad. And then some of those people, I would talk to them about Bitcoin, even today, five years ago as well, whatever. And they would say, oh, Bitcoin's just insane, right? Because it seems to be very context dependent, right? On what you can see and what you right. can't see. You know, like this idea that our vision system is not really about just a flat space of pixels and we do some stuff with it. Mm -hmm. We see objects and tools. Like I see this glass, I see this microphone. I don't see like the blobs and the colors. I see I see tools is the, the principal way that our vision system works or one way to understand the vision system, right? Um, and so looking when people, I mean, even just even the language I'm using, when you look at OSM, some people would like, when you hear OSM, right? Some people, when you touch OSM, people have different right, right, uh, right. analogies on how even their language impacts how they describe mm -hmm. things. Um, some people could see that it was going to work, um, but that, it, that appears to not be a transferable skill, right? Because okay. the same people that could see OSM could work, couldn't see that Bitcoin would work. And they will trot out. It's almost like when you, this happens all the time. You have a conversation with someone and then just not there anymore. And you just hear the media and they're repeating stuff, right? So you, you, you can have someone super smart that you've known a long time or something. And they'll just start saying, well, blockchain won't work because it's using all the energy or something, right? And that's very dismissible. It's very easy to dismiss that with like three different arguments, but they're not there anymore. They're just, they're repeating something that they've heard for whatever reason, it's fascinating, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's definitely not a transferable skill. And I'm sure that I'm subject to that in some ways that I also can't see, right? We all have blind spots. That's why we need to do this again in 10 years. <laughs> I, I do want to start rounding it off though. Um, so like before that, like I, I want to ask like, do you have advice for, for like younger folks who are, who have crazy ideas, you know, maybe like a 23 year old who thinks there's a, mapping the world would be cool. Like someone like that, but today, like, do you, do you have advice for that, that kind of thing? Well, you don't have to be young. Yeah. That's the first thing, right? Sure. So that's a very good point. Most businesses are actually started by people in their forties. Um, you can go look at the statistics, mm -hmm. right? So you don't have to be young for a start. Secondly, um, I would think from the bottom up on everything. Like, so the, the first thing we still even teach people today is you need to go and get a degree, right? And that's sort of a colossal waste of time for most people in, in all kinds of ways. Like there's a, there's ancillary things to a degree, like you grow up and you meet people and so on like that. 
But there are things like, you know, you need to have a degree that just aren't really true anymore, right? And they really deeply are not true in, in all kinds of ways. Like when I was at university, YouTube did not exist. You know, I've been doing some flight training recently as well. And when I first did flight training, you had to pay thousands of dollars for online courses that told you, you know, not to fly your plane into the ground and stuff. But now those are all just YouTube videos for free, right? So the, the cost of this stuff has collapsed to learn anything, right? Um, so I would say like, really state your assumptions crisply and see if they're really true. Because a lot of people would start with, well, I need to start a business, right? So I need to go and make an LLC in America or a limited company in the UK or something. And that's just no longer really true. There's all kinds of things you can do now. Uh, with your own bank account, with no business that you could do, right? There's crypto things you could do with no, no, no pounds or dollars or euros touching you whatsoever, right? So, so you have to dub, double check all your assumptions are actually true and go test them. Um, so that's a big one that I would say. And then probably maybe maybe the yin and yang of that, well, maybe a follow on is there aren't any grown ups. There really are not any grown ups. Um, and you might think that people have it figured out and that they're going and doing something. And like, you know, you might see a CEO of a company and think that they're in charge, or you might see a politician and think that they're leading the way. And this is almost universally not true, right? When you get in those rooms and you see how the board of a company works or the executive leadership of something, um, it's the same as anywhere else. It's a bunch of personalities. It's a bunch of people vying over stuff. It's a bunch of pre-existing prejudices, right? Um, and it's not hard to see it. Again, just look at BMW trying to make electric cars. What you often see is what organizations, they ship the org chart is what they do. They don't make a product at one level. They're shipping the org chart, right? And you can see that in product sometimes. And what that does is it allows a lot of freedom. Because if you deeply understand that there really aren't any grown-ups or people in charge, and that they're often doing things with um, without much knowledge, and they're often riding an elephant that they don't have much control over, right? Like when a when a politician in, uh, a, when a politician says some new policy, what they're usually doing is just responding to what voters say that they want next year, right? It's not like they they come out and say, you know what, we're going to give marriage rights to people or something, mm -hmm. right? What happens is society changes to the point where it's beneficial to a politician to go along with that that thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's um, there's a term for it, but where you uh, you make a decision based on uh, stuff that happened in the past. I forget what it's called. There's a no. It's when it's when you post hoc rationalization. That's the word I'm looking for. So you you rationalize some decision you made after the fact. And if you look at all the, the psychological studies and, and MRIs that people have done, it's terrifying, right? You make decisions, one, before you're conscious of it, right? After you've made the decision, you rationalize it. And it's really deep and everybody does it and it's terrifying, right? It means like what you, what you eat, what you dress, where you work, you're not actually in charge of any of this stuff, right? It's just a, a deep point about people not being in charge. Mm. And so what it gives you is this freedom. So if you if you try and state your assumptions clearly and then go test them, do I really need a degree? Do I really need a company? Do I really need a full-time employee where I live? Or can I hire someone on Upwork for $2 an hour who's perfectly happy and much better qualified to do the work in the Philippines and they speak English, you know? If you go look at all of those assumptions, and it's something that I do, I help people with that sometimes, right? Um, and then don't assume that people have anything figured out. Uh, that's very free, right? You can do a lot of stuff. It really lets you completely change everything. Like a lot of people, like they won't move because I've got friends. Like I live in Amsterdam, I won't move because I've got friends in Amsterdam. But, you know, it's a big place, the world. Maybe you can make new friends over there, right? And these are deep assumptions that people to the fish in water don't have a word for water, don't think about because it's just so co common and key. When I grow up, I get a degree, right? Mm. I'm gonna live in the same place my parents lived in. I'm gonna work on X because it has Y importance, right? And often it doesn't, <laughs> right? Um, then you can go very far and things are so cheap now. So, so cheap. You can find, I've done this. I, I found electronics engineers on Upwork 
um, fantastic people making great products for approximately no money, right? But if I tried to do that in the US with someone near me, it would cost infinite money and I probably wouldn't get the product, right? 3D printing has completely changed the way we do things, right? Prusa, the way that they, they print their printers, is amazing, right? So a lot of people still do plastic forming, like there's a bunch of plastic forming all over this. But there's an upfront cost, right? To make a mold is ten to twenty thousand dollars, something yeah. like that. If you want to change it, you've got to make a new mold. Right. So Prusa, even though they're shipping lots and lots of printers, they still print all the parts with three D printers because it allows them to be nimble, because they can change the design, right, on the fly. So there's all of these constraints people think that they have. Like you're you're living in this box, right? It's like a flight envelope. I can't go too fast. I can't go too steep. I can't go too high. Most of those constraints don't actually exist, right? And then you look at the other guy flying the plane and you think, oh, that's how I need to fly a plane. This is Jonathan Livingston Seagull, right? Which is another book. Um, and they're often wrong, right? Which is Jonathan Livingston Seagull. And then it just blows up and you're just like, whoa, I can do anything. You really can. I mean, mm -hmm. this, there has never been a better time to be alive, right? People think that this is a terrible time. I mean, like, when would you prefer to live? In the age of like cholera <laughs> or the age of syphilis or how about a world war right and we have all these opportunities so it's a long answer um but people are highly 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 capable we can really do a lot of stuff and they often don't because they just either don't know it exists or they feel constrained by some societal pressure or something um and then they think that someone else has done it i mean this happened to dyson hit one of those criticisms of those original vacuum cleaners well was if it was so good, the, the other manufacturers would have made it. And to us, it looks obvious. Obviously, we shouldn't, like probably most of the people listening to this podcast don't realize there used to be vacuum cleaners with bags. And those bags would fill up with dust. It's horrible. And it made it, um, you had to buy new ones, which was their revenue stream, right? Which is why they didn't want bagless, right? And he fought against all of this stuff um, based on a bunch of constraints, right? These guys, so first of all, he relaxed the constraint that you need a bag, right? Then secondly, the, the criticism you got repeatedly from people who was, well, those guys have got it figured out. And they didn't. They didn't have a flying effing clue what was going on. All they had was a business model, right? I'm sure the guy that had originally invented vacuum cleaners and originally invented bags and so on, that was a super interesting guy that would have loved to have worked with Dyson or girl, whatever, right? Would have loved to have worked with Dyson and been innovative, but that person's long since dead. Now it's a company. The company's really becomes its own thing and it wants to focus on repeatable revenue quite rationally. Like if I was at Hoover in 1992 or whatever, I would want to sell bags and have my repeatable business model. Um, but if you're Dyson, it's just none of that stuff is true. And it was an enormous amount of work. He spent like 15 years before he made money or something. Yeah. Five years before he shipped a product, something like that, and then another 10 years of being an enormous amount of debt and pain. And now he's worth infinity money and has factories in five places in the world or something. And it's an enormous amount of work. Who today would spend five years productless in your garage making something? I mean, that's insane, right? Especially in the inflationary environment. He was doing this in the 80s and 90s or whatever with 25% interest rates and riots and strikes and blah 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 and he didn't have the internet he didn't have a 3d printer christ knows how he made it like he talks about learning to weld and all this stuff and if he can do that you know i think we can all all do stuff and i'll end it with one other thing it doesn't have to be the end of the podcast so that's up to you but there's one other thing is just find the problems you know people think they have to think of a problem if you just give a notebook to your 10 best friends and ask them to write down every time they have a problem for a week or you just write down when you have a problem, like your camera was failing. Maybe you should make a good camera that doesn't require wires, that just talks Wi-Fi, that just records, right? It wouldn't be hard to do that today. Um, if you just do that, then you'll very quickly have a set of problems and you can just pick one that's interesting to work on. It doesn't have to be the world's most profitable thing, but it will teach you a whole bunch of things, even if you just solve a simple problem, you know? Um, and that's not a hard, it's not a hard problem to find problems. Yeah. And many got, of them. We've got problems all the time. Right. And most of them are very solvable, very easily solvable. You just need, you know, some physical products or an app. And today it costs nothing to make that. I do 
like rounding the conversations up the same way. Like I like starting them the same way I like finishing them. I like asking people for like books or podcast recommendations. Um, like you've mentioned a bunch already on the during this conversation, but the reason I like doing that is they're still pretty hard to find, to discover. Um, like there's no, there is a bit of recommendation for, for books and podcasts, but most of it is through out of word of mouth. And I find that you, you, you get to learn a little bit more about who a person is by what they've read and what they recommend. So I don't know if there's maybe like one or two books and, and same for podcasts that, you know, you think might be interesting for people to read or listen to. Well, I mean, the first, the first approximation is you should read and it doesn't matter what you should read. You should just read stuff that you like and eventually you'll find good books, right? The The problem isn't necessarily that, people, that they don't have the right book or, or podcast, it's that mm -hmm. they just don't read. And reading is different, like podcasts are like ice cream, you know what I mean, or a donut. And well, maybe that's a little bit extreme, but reading is really important. That's like having your steak and vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. Podcasts are a little bit like- The junk food. The, the, the junk food, right? And some podcasts can be very, very good, but you're not getting the same focus, concentration, and learning as you would from sitting with a book. Because typically when people are doing a podcast, they're driving, they're walking, they're doing something else, and you're just not there. You think you're there, but probably anyone with an fMRI would tell you that you're not really there, right, at some level. So podcasts are great for certain things. The podcast, number one podcast that I would recommend is Econ Talk, right? But it's... It's going to sound about as, as, as fascinating as, as like watching paint dry, but it's, it's an economist called Ross Roberts. And for 10 or 15 years or something, he's been interviewing people every week, often economists, but also other people. And what it teaches you is that, um, what it taught me is that everything is usually backwards. So let me give you an example. I can remember years ago, you might remember that the, the bees are dying was a thing. Yep. The bees are dying, right? It was all over the newspapers and TV and so on. So what he did was he interviewed an economist who studied bee prices. And economics is really useful as a set of tools. It's not exclusively useful. There are other tools that are also useful, but it's very useful for some things. And if the bees are really dying, what should happen to the price of bees? Because bees are a tradable commodity. People buy and sell them all the time. Okay. So if the bees are dying, what should happen to the price of bees? It should go up. It should go up. What was happening? They weren't going up, right? In fact, it was quite the opposite. So what you find a lot with, with Econ Talk is that he's a very careful guy. The, the podcast is only an hour long each time, roughly. And he gives a lot of space for stuff that he disagrees with. And then he just tries to go for the bottom-up logic. Like, if the bees are dying, the price of queen bees should go up, dramatically, in fact. And they weren't, right? And so why is that? Well, supply and demand aren't being impacted like you're being told. Maybe the bee lobby, believe it or not, there's a bee lobby, right? Maybe the bee lobby are looking for money. Maybe that's a better explanation. And I'm not saying that was the explanation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you'll find time after time after time on Econ Talk, basically what happens, they present something, they bring in an expert, sometimes an economist, not always, right? And then to find the realities. So one, I mean, one of my favorite ones was he interviewed a hairdresser, I think at least twice, about what it's like to run a hairdressing business. Because you as the customer, you walk in and you're like, you sit down, you have some banter and they cut your hair or something. But for them, they're, what they see is completely different, right? They have a big problem. How do I get rid of all the hair, right? What do I say to this customer again, right? To make them feel welcome and warm, right? What products should I buy? You know, how much is my electricity bill, right? They have a completely different point of view. So Econ Talk as a podcast is incredible. Um, if you're so inclined at learning why you're wrong, because that mostly is what that podcast is about. It's like, you think X, unfortunately, it's probably Y, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same as reading The Economist itself. When you read The Economist, the story is usually, it goes, here's a problem, right? Here's why a market would fix it. And here's why there's not going to be a market anytime soon. That is every Economist story for the last 100 years or whatever, however long The Economist has been going. So that's the podcast. Um, on books, books are difficult because I've read a lot of books. <laughs> and anyone who's read a lot of books, it's very difficult to give a recommendation, right? Mm -hmm. But I think um, for me, at least in the last couple of years, the number one book has been Travels by Michael Crichton. That I have reread multiple times. 
because um, that book was very helpful in a number of ways. Michael Crichton, it turns out, was incredibly clever. Right, a lot of a lot of authors are quite smart and stuff, but Michael Crichton was sort of several orders of magnitude above that. Very, very deeply smart guy, um, that noticed all of these single these simple problems. And the book begins like chapter one. So he he got a medical degree at Harvard, and chapter one is about how terrible medicine is. And anyone who's looked at medicine, including many in the in the in the profession, will tell you just how deeply awful medicine is in all kinds of ways. Right. Like a modern example is we have 40 million Americans have type 2 diabetes in the United States. 40 million. Type 2 diabetes is entirely curable with diet, but most people don't know that, right? You, you take a pill and uh, you take insulin shots, right? Which is not a solution. In fact, it makes it worse over time and eventually your feet fall off, you go blind and you die. Um, if you just cut out carbohydrates, it turns out you can, you can cure type 2 diabetes, which is stunning. But what does it say about the system? Right, and what the system does, not just in America, I'm not picking on America, mm -hmm. worldwide healthcare is, is an issue. Um, so anyway, the book begins with like, hey, healthcare's terrible. And he's writing from the perspective of the 70s, basically, okay. where it was even more terrible, right? And I'm like reading this and agreeing with it. And then he goes off into all this esoteric stuff, um, which made no sense to me, especially as someone who studied physics. So it's like talks about outer body experiences and uh, psychics and aura and all kinds of other esoteric weird stuff, which is definitely outside the realm of what a physicist would consider rational, right? And he goes off and then he, he like talks about it in the same language and level as medicine is bad. So it's like, agree with you, agree with you, agree with you. What the hell are you talking about? And then I go and I repeated a bunch of stuff that he did and it turns out he was right. And you're like, oh, okay. And then he also has a bunch of deep points in his book about the inability for people to see something without putting a mental model on it. Um, which is very deep. So that, that's a that's a very deep and good book. I'd also say anything by Neil Stevenson was good. But in a different time in my life, I'd say anything by Terry Pratchett was a great great idea too. Um, and there's a lot of great books out there to understand how the world works, even if you disagree with it. Yeah, certainly picking something that you disagree with is probably the best thing to do. Pretty hard as well, but it's like sticking to something, like to listening or reading to something you disagree with, I think. It takes practice. Yeah. Yeah, it does. But it's often you have you have you you have disproportionate upside if you can go against the crowd. Yeah. Not necessarily that you're even right, right? Because the like with markets, if everyone's selling, you should buy. If everyone's buying, you should sell. But people do the exact opposite. Right? It's a common common thing that when the market crashes, everyone sells. But the correct thing to do, the logically correct thing to do, as long as you have a time frame, mm -hmm. if you're going to die tomorrow, it doesn't matter, right? But if you're going to die in 50 years, then you should buy when people are selling, right? It's very, very simple. But everyone does the opposite. Like, almost literally everyone does the opposite, right? So there's very simple ways that if you just go against the crowd or have knowledge that they don't, that your life can be better. And look, I'm giving a monetary example because it's simple, but the you know, more direct example is everyone eats garbage. Everyone really does eat garbage, right? And you don't have to, <laughs> right? But we do because we're brought up. I was brought up eating garbage, right? I was, you know, you had to finish the crust on your sandwich. It turns out that's terrible for you, right? You know, bread is like literally awful. <laughs> I don't know if I can take that. Uh, <laughs> well, as a French person, maybe. Like, I think that's too much disagreement there. Well, maybe. But I mean, the biochemistry <laughs> no, no, no. is pretty clear. I, I, I get your point. Uh, like, wait, or you just keep asking why is another one. We're going off topic again. But like, why do you brush your teeth? But it's such a, it's such a core part of the Western world that we don't even think about it anymore. Why do you brush your teeth, mm -hmm. right? Well, you brush your teeth to get bits of food out of your, your teeth. Animals don't brush their teeth. They have perfect teeth in the wild, right? Just go look at photos of monkeys or whatever, or lions. They have perfect teeth. There's no vet walking around scrubbing their teeth every day. They don't like sit in a mirror and scrub, right? So we brush our teeth to get the food out, but it turns out other things don't and their teeth are fine. Well, why do we get the food out? Well, primarily because that food is carbohydrates, right? And we didn't historically as a, as a species, we didn't eat carbohydrates until, you know, give or take 10,000 10, years ago when we invented farming, right? Before then, what did we eat? Well, primarily fat and protein, right? Primarily because carbohydrates weren't even available, right? You might have like some berries or something, 
once in the summer, but those berries have no relation on the berries that you get at the store today. They're completely different. Uh -huh. Like if you have a, a wild strawberry, it's about this big. <laughs> it tastes roughly of strawberry, right? Compared to the ginormous thing you have today that's like more water and sugar and less nutrients or whatever, right? So you, ask, you keep asking why, and it's basically because we eat carbohydrates all day long. Why do we eat carbohydrates all day long? Well, because they're, they're cheap, uh, they have long storage value, you're able to transport them. But that has nothing to do with your health. I mean, why do people get cancer? All of that stuff is pretty simple. People didn't used to get cancer, people don't know this, but you know, before basically, 1750 or something ish nobody got cancer you know there are even records of this you had other things too yeah. right you had horrible diseases and pneumonia and cholera or whatever that killed you off but um if you just go against the crowd you can go awfully far just by not following the crowd and, and the point isn't it's not just a financial monetary point it's also your health it's what you work on it's what you focus on right stop caring about everything. Like the media is an emergency machine that wants you to care about everything. And you can't like take care of every global emergency or every local emergency now, right? Just stop caring about stuff you don't control. And you can go very far, but that's just Buddhist, right? So it's not just monetary. It's all these other things that you can do. I think that's a great way to end it. Yeah, there you go. Steve, thanks a lot for Thank the time. You. Thanks for uh, coming on and having a conversation with me. Thank you. Thank you.